and thank you very much for joining in this webinar. Let me introduce myself. I'm Marcella D'Souza, uh, the director of the Water Center for Resilient Studies of Watershed Organization Trust. On behalf of the co-hosts of this event, the National Rainfed Area Authority, WOTR, and the Collaborative for EcoBari, I welcome you all to this webinar on farm ponds for securing agriculture for rain-fed regions, a call for sustainable approaches. We have received an overwhelming response to this webinar from across the country, the length and breadth of it, and even overseas. It shows that this topic is of great interest. A warm welcome to you all, to all of us as stakeholders of this issue. We are either representatives from the various government bodies, either at the national or at the state levels, from various <coughs> scientific bodies, from academia, from donor communities. We even have villagers who will be joining us and civil society organizations. To all of us concerned citizens, a warm welcome. I extend a very special welcome to our guests, who, to our participants who are really, uh, who really have a very busy schedule. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Eknat Taule, the Principal Secretary of Agriculture, Soil and Water Conservation of the Government of Maharashtra. Thank you so much, Mr. Shashi Shekhar, the former Secretary of the Ministry of Jal Shakti. Mr. Sunil Kumar, the Chairman of the Central Groundwater Authority. Mr. C.S. Murthy, the CGM of the farm sector in Nabad headquarters. Professor Sanjay Srivastava, the Vice Chancellor of the Manav Rachna University. Dr. Venkateshwar Lu, the former Vice Chancellor of the Parbhani Agriculture University. A very warm welcome to all of you who will be co-hosts and participants. I'd like to extend a very particular welcome to Dr. Deepankar Saha. Let me give you a background to this particular event. In WOTR, we have been concerned about farm ponds since some years. As we have a very junior team of researchers, we pulled in Dr. Dipankar Saha to guide us to make sense of what we see, our findings on the ground. And as many of you who know Dr. Saha, he insisted on going to the field. But once he had gone to the field to get a better understanding of what we were observing, the only thing he could tell us is, let's take it to a webinar at a national level. And so, if we have to blame anybody for this event, it is Dr. Saha. Dr. Saha, thank you so much for motivating us because I think you have done something really good for us. So we look forward, dear friends, to a wonderful participation of this afternoon. I'm sure it is going to be a very interesting and meaningful engagement. And while we would like to have a lot of interaction I'm not sure whether we can do justice to the subject during the next two and a half hours. What I do anticipate is this is only the beginning of a lot of other meaningful discussions that we need to take forward as the time comes ahead. And so dear friends, I would like to suggest something. We would like to capture all your thoughts, all your concerns, all your interest, the critique, the thought, the suggestions, whatever it is you can, please be free to put it in the chat box. It is this chat box that is going to enrich us during this discussion and as we go forward. And so dear friends, in favor of time, I would like to say once more a warm welcome and a, a meaningful discussion for the rest of the afternoon and after. 
And so once more on behalf of the co-hosts, the National Rainfed Area Authority, and Dr. Dalbai will be with us also, uh, the Watershed Organization Trust and the Research Unit uh, WCRES, and the collaborative Ecobari, together with our supporters, the Manav Rachna University, Nabad, and Honeywell, we wish you all and we wish us all a very interesting and useful and meaningful afternoon as we go ahead. In order to go forward, I would now like to invite Dr. Dibankar Saha to set the agenda, uh, to set the stage and the context of this whole webinar. So Dr. Saha, I hand over to you, please. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks to Dr. Marcilla for, for your kind words. Uh, in fact, uh, first of all, a warm welcome to all the luminaries who are present here. Uh, Sri Eknar Dawle Saab, uh, our uh, Sasi Sekhar Saab, who was former Secretary, Minister of Water Resources. Then uh, Mr. Sunil Kumar, who is the Chairman of Central Groundwater uh, Authority. Uh, then uh, uh, Murthy Saab, Sanjay Sivastav Saab. And I see in the, in the participant list, there are many, many luminaries, many, many senior persons, they are participating in this very, very important uh, workshop. We seek your indulgence and we also waiting for your opinion and uh, 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 through the conversation in this webinar. You know, this idea has come that the, there is a lot of emphasis on farm pond in different parts of India. And particularly the farm ponds, government is considering uh, that in the rain fed area where there is a, a less uh, water resource available, the farm pond uh, will serve a great role in substantive irrigation during the Kharif season, as well as it will help in uh, Ravi irrigation. Now, <clears throat> uh, uh, there are some subsidy scheme also for the farm ponds and the farm ponds are being dug. But when, uh, say, about last two years ago, when I started the conversation with Dr. Marcilla, and I will give her all credit that uh, he has taken this uh, forward as a mission mode, uh, I visited some field areas in the deep uh, uh, is arid, semi-arid region of Maharashtra where rainfall is not adequate and the aquifer is not that strong. I mean, they are hard rock aquifer. The groundwater potential is less. And uh, to my surprise, uh, we could see, we heard that earlier, but seeing is believing. We can see that the farm ponds are being filled up with groundwater that is pumped from underground. Okay, that is, uh, and they are storing it over ground and with a polythene lining at the bottom so that it doesn't loss through uh, seepage into again into the soil. But there is no prevention for uh, uh, evaporation. About 20, 20, 20, 25% goes as evaporation loss, we all uh, know. Besides, there are many other issues. I mean, those, I have seen some of the palm ponds, though are so large, more than a football field. So they are extracting groundwater. If they are not getting enough, enough groundwater, they are going deeper. And, uh, uh, and in the process, I would say the groundwater sustainability in a larger scenario, it is getting hard. I mean, water sustainability also, groundwater is also a major component in those rain-fed areas. But total water sustainability issues are not uh, being addressed properly through these activities. I mean, one can go deeper, the farm pond owners, they are go deeper, taking out water, but at the same time, the shallow wells, they are getting dry and they are getting less water in the summer season or non-monsoon season. There is widening uh, inequity. Uh, so uh, we thought that let there be a discussion. Obviously, there are many, many positive points of the farm ponds. The agricultural output has increased. The, the farmers are now well off those who are uh, the, owning the farm ponds. And at the same time, the people, they are getting motivated that that farm pond owners, they are they is getting a good yield in his crop. So I should also try for uh, farm ponds. So there are uh, some, uh, uh, some issues which are not very uh, conducive, but at the same time, some issues, definitely they are uh, positive. So with this note, uh, uh, I will say that we have, we are lucky that we have 
lot of luminaries and from a wide spectrum, from hardcore uh, technical person to the policy makers, uh, to the civil society, uh, to the economists, sociologists, everywhere, every from every domain of water, people are here and we are lucky, I would say, in that way. So I would, uh, uh, I, I would say that I'm very fortunate that I'm able to take uh, part in this, such a rich conversation that will go on for another uh, two and a half hours. So with these few words, uh, I will now invite uh, uh, Sasi Shekhar Saab uh, to, uh, to share his thoughts. Uh, Sasi Shekhar Saab needs no introduction, <clears throat> I mean, in India to the water fraternity and groundwater fraternity. He was uh, our secretary when I was in member uh, Central Groundwater Board. And he was so, so passionate about water and about groundwater. Uh, how I have no words to express that. And um, uh, he always think of sustainability and above all, what inspired me maximum from him that he always take care of the equity of water that certain say all section should get benefit of sustainable water management. So with this, a uh, few words about, I will now invite Sasi Shekhar Saab to uh, say a few words. In fact, there is some change in the program because he has to go for some urgent in, uh, meeting. So we have little bit uh, uh, changed the program with permission of Eknath Saab because he was the first speaker. So I will now request Sasi Shekhar Saab to share his thoughts. Sir. Th thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you, Dipankar and uh, uh, Dr. Marshala D'Souza for uh, inviting me to share my thoughts on this important subject. You know, when this particular uh, subject was brought in, like farm pond, it was basically aimed to improve income of the farmers and in improve productivity productivity of lands in the rain fed area and basically de-stress the farmers from uh, frequent uh, droughts <clears throat> the concept was excellent concept uh, had has no challenge farm pond program became a kind of a national program and it has a lot of meaning in areas which are not supported with irrigation but basically rain fed which are dependent on entirely on the rain fed and areas like Maharashtra, Karnataka, Andhra, Telangana, part Tamil Nadu, part Madhya Pradesh etc. <clears throat> have significantly benefited. Actually, farm pond, as it was conceived, were meant to hold groundwater. So, sorry, meant to uh, meant to hold uh, surface runoff into a small, small ponds and provide water to the crops when there is a gap between two rains. When the crop, when the crops face stress because of delay in two rainfalls and that's the time when you have to provide it was supposed to provide that supportive irrigation to keep the crops alive and uh, kicking it has indeed served a great uh, purpose to the farmers it has uh, stabilized the uh, productivity of rain fed uh, uh, farmers who are engaged in the uh, rain fed areas <clears throat> It has uh, improved income from the rain-fed areas uh, in the country. So it has, caused, has done a great uh, boon. But as any program, well-intentioned program of the government is manipulated by some for their benefited at the cost of others, I see that <clears throat> this program has unfortunately fallen trapped to the same. Farm ponds are supposed to serve two purposes. One, as I said that, uh, you know, your 
you are holding the rainwater surface runoff into a pond and provide protective irrigation to crops which uh, face uh, stress during two prolonged uh, rainfalls. But it also is supposed to recharge groundwater. Prime Minister has time and again said that harvest the rainwater where it falls. So farm pond actually fits into that concept very well. So it was supposed to serve both the purposes, both one, as I again, I repeat ad nauseum, to, to, to de-stress, uh, de-water stress, I would say, of the crops on account or due to uh, delay in uh, to rainfalls, and second also to recharge uh, groundwater. If we, if we line the farm pond, which unfortunately, happens in most of the cases <clears throat> then first purpose obviously the second purpose purpose obviously is defeated because it is not allowing any uh, uh, water to percolate to, uh, to to improve the groundwater but more disastrous is if we pump groundwater to fill up uh, the farm ponds to meet the needs it's a double triple whammy this kind of action is a double triple whammy one that in hard rock area like the areas that i mentioned maharashtra karnataka telangana andhra etc which are not very supportive of groundwater groundwater by and large is dependent on certain geological structures I will not go into detail on those, of those geological structures. That will require a separate session altogether. And I am sure the Pankar is a much better person to talk about that. But in Maharashtra, particularly where this is more prevalent, this kind of uh, arrangement, this kind of uh, activity where you know, you're pumping in groundwater to fill up farm pond to, to, to meet the protective irrigation is unfortunately not sustainable at all. In fact, it creates a double whammy. One, that Maharashtra in the geological past had a series of episodes of uh, uh, volcanic event and you have layers of volcanic uh, rock uh, depositions and between the two volcanic events you have the fractured or the, uh, the, the weathered portion which actually hold water and this water travels through cracks and through bubbles in the in the in the uh, in the volcanic uh, rocks and then they are held there if you keep mining this water if you keep drawing this water the groundwater table will keep going down because water travels only through cracks to the deeper uh, and deeper layer so ultimately time will come when you will be mining water which was which has which has become groundwater during the Sivaji's time. You know, this layer is formed at different times. So the water table also has gone, I mean, the water has percolated down to the lower and lower and the lower layers in the, in the historical past. So we keep, and as we draw water the ground, from uh, those layers, the groundwater shifts to the next layer, lower layer, then to the next lower layer. So at what, up to what point we will go? And to go down to that level needs huge resources. And some of the wells in uh, Maharashtra would, would, would cost more than a couple of lakhs of rupees. So who can bear this loss? Who can, who can afford this kind, of, uh, uh, this kind of investment? This is bigger farmers only. The sugarcane farmers, the bigger farmers, the orchard farmers, and more and more we draw water from the, uh, the layers below and below, more and more the smaller farmers will be deprived of the groundwater, which they are also using it as protective source of irrigation to meet the protective needs of crops. So ultimately, one side we deplete the groundwater, we push the groundwater down to a level where it will require huge amount of pumping and huge amount of investment 
and second side on the equity front we are depriving the uh, depriving the small and medium farmers of this vital input which literally will save them at the time of crisis crisis due to you know uh, gap in a longer gap in between two rainfalls that kind of situation is indeed dangerous that kind of situation is bad in uh, in implementation i don't say it's bad in policy but it's definitely bad in intention and government has to see that uh, there is a policy level intervention to ensure policy level and uh, implementation level in, uh, intervention to ensure that farm pounds are promoted but not farm pounds which are lined a b even if they are lined at least they are not filled with groundwater groundwater filling of farm pond to me let me not sound very strong word but it's a crime it's a crime because groundwater is a common pool resource everybody has a right to access that source and it must be equitably addressed we had in our policy suggestion to the groundwater to the government i was a member of uh, the team which drafted the the national uh, draft national uh, water policy which is yet to be published uh, or has yet to be uh, put out to the public domain but we very strongly suggested that groundwater management both surface and groundwater management must be handed over to the community community must take the responsibility of managing groundwater and such surface runoff so that there is an equity in its distribution there is a equity in its usage when community decides sits together and decide then first and foremost you take into account how much of water i have how much of resource i have within my reach then what i need to do to improve increase my reach so as a community you decide over a watershed over a over a, a, a catchment area of a, uh, of a aquifer and then as a community you decide what crop i should grow because i have there is a limitation in availability of water and in that backdrop you also set up some farm ponds so that as a community you you de stress your crop from water needs hey ala jodala jo charger when they actually need so taking this into account i find that there are policy makers uh, in this seminar like the uh, the, the secretary mr eknath uh, then uh, the uh, the the uh, groundwater uh, chairman of groundwater board authority and uh, some more people i believe dalave is also there ashok so we need to debate this and see how we constitute how do we construct a policy where ground water and farm pond they complement each other not compete with each other actually we are creating we have set up a situation we are creating a situation where they are competing with each other and in the process of competition we are depriving the uh, small and marginal farmer of their vital needs their survival their survival depends on this and no wonder people in this belts uh, they 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 uh, take to extreme steps uh, of uh, ending their lives they cannot afford to lose the crop that's this means of sustenance there's a means of livelihood and that is what take them forward so the policy on surface water runoff farm pond and ground water should be seen as a comprehensive 360 degree and supplement it with uh, cropping pattern the way we deliver what deliver water to the crops from this 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 360 degrees degrees system so that nobody faces any 
problem it is equitable it is uh, it meets everybody needs nobody gains at the cost of others and that is that is how the entire process will become sustainable will increase the income and increase the income of not one but all that's why it is required to be managed by the community with these words i thought that i should not take more time i hope i have a, a set along with dipankar set the tone of the today's discussion unfortunately i will not be able to hear uh, most of you because i have to now leave but it would have been my pleasure to uh, be with you and hear uh, people like joy and uh, some of the senior people who are uh, who are very very knowledgeable i have learned a lot from them thank you very much thank you sir Uh, for your uh, words and uh, we'll 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 miss you sir in the later part of our seminar but we'll inform you the uh, our recommendations and what has transpired yes i would look forward to that thank, thank you very much thank thanks you. shashi ji yeah. thank you joy ji how are you good good long nice seeing you yeah long time yeah nice good yes uh, dr shekhar thank you very much on behalf of us and sure with this uh, workshop a webinar that we have started we will approach you because we know that with you we can take it forward and find solutions with all of us participants together so thank you very much i look forward to any kind of support that i can provide it will be my pleasure and i'll do it with passion thank you say. thank you very very thank much you. yes yes and with this i would now like to invite uh, mr eknath dawle uh, mr eknath dawle is uh, principal secretary for agriculture and soil and water conservation and he faces a very big challenge of seeing how farmers in our dry land regions of maharashtra can access water and become secure thank you so much mr dawle for participating and for coming over here for giving us your time in spite of your very busy schedule but you know we cannot go forward without having you and your blessings in this whole effort it is not just only for maharashtra but this particular event is also for the rest of the country so thank you mr dawle i would now invite you to uh, give us your uh, keynote speech to tell us how we can go forward thank you yeah now good afternoon to all of the participants uh thank you to dr lobo and uh, the team uh, who invited us to participate in to this uh, uh, conversation this workshop uh, is a uh, as focus on a very a burning topic when I mean, just uh, the two speaker earlier mentioned that uh, there are pros and cons of the the structures which basically i mean there are uh, two sides and always if you say any technology there are always two sides so not a single technology is without benefits and it's a it's a limitations because this structure is a new structure in a tradition it is it's not a traditional water conservation structure it is a something a new intervention innovated by the farmers by taking a clue from a, a non agriculture because this was used for as a uh, uh, for the purpose of a non agriculture industrial purpose ponds then the refill tanks then it was uh, basically used as a the western countries so this lining is used for the land pit side so obviously taking from the clues the particularly the some farmers in western maharashtra they understood that uh, this can be used as a good storage uh, tank capacity and this can be used. but i have to i what i will do i will uh, uh, go on two aspects on this one so first i will go into the traditional uh, farm ponds which base you have to using to uh, this one it's a normal farm pond without lining and second is the farm pond with lining so uh, and then we will have uh, some uh, basically discussion point on that at how it could be taken forward uh, we had i mean this since last 
I'm working in the, in the field as a from CEO, collectors and resources. The last 25 years, I'm working in the same field. I mean, either in the agriculture and as a district collector, CEO, and this is the most, mostly the rural and the watershed works. So, uh, as a part of this one, if you see the traditional farm bonds, this concept was introduced in 1994 96 when the Manuli watershed development program was in this with the help of the Dr. Punjab Rao Deshmukh Kushi with Happy, Tapola, and the World Bank. So, that uh, has been devised. And uh, in Manuli watershed, they come to the conclusion that 10 hectare area uh, will, I mean, use. The 10 hectare area, then take a farm pond at the lower end side, then collect rainwater, and then uh, have the 100 feet bore well below that one, and then or uh, the small dug well, and you can have the some water security on that one. But having said this thing, in the same districts around around this, uh, there was a saline track, Purna Basin one. So in that area, which uh, and even the farmers in otherwise also when there is a black cotton soil, and uh, traditionally the farmer used to have because the land soil parcel size in Vidarbha Marathwada area was the larger one, and for the purpose of the at the time of the sowing, so there was no dug well around here and there. So the water requirement for the purpose of I mean the for the uh, uh, drinking water for the animals and even some for uh, uh, for uh, uh, some agriculture purpose. There was no source of the agriculture and farmer used to again have some sort of pond. Not technically this was type of pond, but it was a very small pond, maybe uh, around 1 lakh, 2 lakh uh, liter capacity, maximum 5 lakh capacity depending on the farm size. And that because of the uh, impermeability of the black soil, cotton soil, that used to be having around the year there was only the depletion because of the transfer operation was there and that's what the losses otherwise it was as good as impermeable uh, 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 time storage even in the saline track in Arpola and around area and even in the most of this area we have seen such type of farmers uh, using so farm pond per se is not a new concept as such i mean this traditional because farmers were using it when we compare it with the dug well, I mean, see, when we talk about the water structure, then immediately the next competitive structure to the farm pond is the dug well. Again, if you see this dug well, the government has uh, taken an initiative on the promoting the farm ponds and the uh, dug wells, and so that at least some water security, at least uh, one or two protective irrigation during the dry spell, uh, will ensure the. Uh, 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 water security to the crops and that, that there should not be the loss on the part of the yield. So with this vision, government of Maharashtra, I mean, since last 25 years, uh, were uh, uh, promoting this farm pond activity and at the same time of the dug wells also. But when we talk about the dug well, no one talks about its excavation because it's exploring it, water excavation sector. So, no, see, we talk about uh, this thing, but for the dug well, it is a shallow aquifer structure and that's why it is appreciated. But at the same time, if you look from that point of view, this farm pond, this is a farm pond is a, again a, a very shallow structure. So, Dugwell, farmers prefer Dugwell because at least it has some water available during the dry spell and that's it. So, over the period of a time, the popularity of a farm pond has been taken by the Dugwell. And when you see the eastern Maharashtra, particularly the Malguzari Talavi area, where the traditional water bodies were, there is a body structure. Body was taken, body was supposed to take at the higher elevation. Farm pot was supposed to take at the lower elevation because farm pot was supposed to take all the uh, water uh, at the lower end. But the body was supposed to uh, uh, take water at the higher end. And when there is a shortage, so because of the gravity, there has to be in the uh, some uh, water should go to the paddy farm. So that was the uh, structure. So though traditionally having the uh, same meaning, but one was used to use for the, both are was used to for the dry spell, but the location wise it was a different because in assured rainfall area, there was no issue of a, a getting filtered um, farm pond. So in Eastern Vidarbha, uh, that was there because of that uh, uh, assured rainfall, the farm pond, uh, that body 
was filled with assured rainfall. But over the period of time, since I am seeing this four phenomena since last 25 years, so changes had been in the Western Maharashtra, particularly the value-added agriculture and the horticulture farmers. They found it very difficult uh, to depend on the groundwater source because there was not certainty of the groundwater source that where the from at what time water will be available, what time water will come there. So some farmer innovatively, particularly in Nashik and Solapur area, particularly I have seen the Nashik area in 1994. The grape farmers first uh, time they have used this farm pond with lining structure for giving us some protective uh, irrigation for protective water to the grape orchards. And over the period, it has been become a popular in some part of the area. But again, it remained confined to some area because of the, the cost, the capital cost involved in to dug, uh, uh, this uh, um, digging the farm pond, constructing the farm pond lining was a bit out of the scope of the normal farmers. But when the MID, Mission on Integrated Development Horticulture, the scheme was uh, basically introduced and there was a concept of the community farm pond in this one, I think 2007 onward. So this farm pond has taken then, the, because it was for the horticulture pond, but this farm pond has taken the, uh, basically the lead. And I think, sir, after 2007 onward, then it has reached to the other than the Nasik Solapur region, it has reached to the other parts of the market. And nowadays, if you see that Aurangabad, Jalna, and say every district, so there is a demand on the uh, farm ponds. So earlier government in 2016-17 has launched the scheme of farm pond on Nimma, Magil Chala Shetra. Jobik, farm pond, farm pond that was the slogan of the government and we fulfilled it. Around 3 lakh farm pond has been digged for that period and around 2.5 uh, lakh dug wells has been constructed during that period. So it was very popular. And then the, there was a the demand from the farmer that we request the lining to those plastics. It was a very small, small 30 meter by 30 meter or somewhere it's a 20 by 20 meter by 3 meter depth. So very, very small, small uh, structure was there. And then uh, we again introduced the scheme of the providing the plastic lining to the streets. Around 75,000 rupees subsidy was given to this one. And uh, I mean, we need to believe on the technology because sometimes, you know, what uh, it's an evolution over the process. We have to understand this because it takes 25 years to reach farmers to this conclusion. When we talk about the technology, when the green revolution come in the agriculture sector, so this that there was a resistance on that part. Similarly, this again was that green revolution is only for the high end farmers, not to the farmers. Second uh, generation uh, the reform, the second generation uh, technological revolution come when the BT was introduced into the cotton. So no one, I mean, including all intellectuals and all this, they all, I mean, denied the this thing, yes, it is not, uh, uh, no one recommended that the BT should. But as on today, 99% cotton is under BT. See, people are there for their own, people will take their decision on the basis of the rational whether it's pros and cons. I mean, it's right to say, yes, there are this thing, there are this thing, yes, this should not be done, this should be done. Having said this thing, so I, I, at the opening, I said, for any technology, there are plus, there are positive points as well as there are limitations. You take any technology. I mean, the technology where which we are using as the virtual technology, it has its limitation, it has its poison. So no technology is without the limitation. The point earlier, Speaker mentioned that I appreciate and that is the Doug will should not, this farm pond shall not, I again repeat, shall not be filled with the bore wells. Because this is a, again, you are exploring the, uh, the, the basically the uh, more deep aquifer for this purpose. So this is a, a completely no one, I mean, including the government in no one is in it. But there is a subsurface flow when there is a rainfall, there is sufficient rainfall, there is drains out, there is a hundred percent. I mean, when we talk about this area, we have to see the topography of the Maharashtra. It's a 
97% area, if you see this one, it's only 3 to 4% area. Uh, 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 if, the, if you see the basalt uh, topography of 80% comes under this one. But the water holding capacity of the basalt rock is not more than 3-4%. So when we see the watershed, our all technologies in the Vidarbha, Marathwada region, because what happens is the all DPAP area where the rainfall is around 400, 500. Even today, if you see the Ahmednagar, you see the all uh, the small, small drains, uh, drain, uh, streams drains out. So when there is a saturation of the aquifer, then what that where this water should be used? So this water has to be has to be used for this purpose to fill the type the such type of the farm pond, and that should be used for the purpose of the rest period of this time. So we as a government never, never said that it should be taken at the cost of the some farmers. But if there is a subsurface flow, it's always going to some drains and that drains going to the some diamonds, it ultimately is going to some drains. And this farm bonds, how much it is there? So 30 by 30 by 3, it's not more than the 27, like 30 lakh liter water is there. So there are some farmers who had this 40 meters on this one. I mean. Uh, obviously, there are some, uh, but that is are the exception. If you see the Ahmed, uh, Jalna and Aurangabad, it is one of the best success story of using the farm pond for the purpose of the seed oranges, seed production, all vegetables type of this thing. I mean, I will request some of the uh, uh, opinion maker who basically speak about this type of farms and see the Karvanchi itself. Uh, Vijayana Borade, one of the leading uh, the watershed, the uh, um, uh, the pioneer uh, into Maharashtra, the Karbanj village, which has been developed, you find around 250 farm ponds are there lying. I mean, so number may be around, but it's more than 200. So, but then there is a subsurface flow available, and abundance water is available. Then why should not be filled with this water? So, if you are seeing this one, then is it the way that the upper topography people get defrauded at the cost of the uh, lower topography, which has the due advantage in any case otherwise. Means if you take the watershed itself, the farmers along the stream side has always a better endowment compared to the top farmers. If the top farmers had used his due share of water, then we should not uh, uh, say that the lower farmers who had the drain side or the so Nala side is being deprived. So we should, I think, that should not be the, our approach when we make our uh, uh, decisions and when we, so this is the uh, one point i just want to make on that part uh, uh, there was a, one committee uh, high power committee appointed by the government uh, uh, honorable high court when the jalit shwar abhiyan was uh, there and there was uh, issues regarding some technical aspect so that type it, the one point was is that how much should be the farm ponds i mean what should be the number of uh, appropriate farm ponds I mean, uh, in one watershed or uh, 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 depending on the rainfall. So that point is one decision we need to have it really, we require some expertise on that, that. What shall be the optimum water, uh, what should be the optimum number of the farm ponds per hectare or per site, depending on, because the rainfall is less, then per hectare area will be more. If the rainfall is more, per hectare area will be less. So depend on, I mean, this but, but, there has to be now some rational that how it should be the farm cost number on that. But having said all this, both the point I was just saying. So we are very cautious about this thing. We are promoting as a government, we are promoting farm ponds with aligning. I don't have any hesitations to say this one. Subject to the rider that it has been not at the cost of the ground. That is the only underlying. That is the say from my side. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Dawle, for giving us the perspective of, uh, you know, how you see it and the situation over here. I think these are, are valuable inputs because we need to understand all the perspectives when we have to uh, take this whole discussion forward. Thank you very much for your time. And we do look forward to you being with us for the rest of this, uh, uh, this uh, at least an hour or two because this will be helpful for us then to take it forward later. Thank you so much. Okay. <coughs> I, will now, I will now invite uh, uh, Mr. K.J. Joy 
uh, I think he's not an unknown figure over here in the field of water. And uh, you have been doing a lot of work in the water sector and you're well known over there. And so I would invite you to uh, please take over the panel, the yeah. presentations that are going to be um, presented now. Thank you so much, Joy. Yeah. Uh, Thanks, Marcella. And uh, once again, a very warm welcome to a very interesting and very, I mean, very important uh, uh, topic of this uh, webinar. And I think this overwhelming participation, which we can see, and I think people, those who are not able to see the numbers, we are close to 220, 30 people participating in this uh, on this Zoom link itself. And I'm sure there may be other platforms people are logging on and to be part of it. And then I don't think I've been able uh, ever been a part of a webinar which has been able to attract so much of interest and I think that is mainly because of the topicality of this issue and many of us have been uh, thinking of this. So it's interesting that the organizers thought of uh, doing this as a good webinar and things and I'm sure it will lead to uh, uh, a way forward uh, and I think the main purpose of this webinar itself is to have a nuanced understanding of farm ponds and also to reposition it uh, basically, the uh, earlier speakers did bring out this whole issue of uh, sustainability of the resource itself, equitable access, or the distributional, redistributional issues, and creating water security to our farmers, all those uh, depend on land and water for their livelihoods uh, in the uh, in the rainfed regions of this country. So I think uh, with that intro, and I'd like to get into the next, uh, the second segment uh, of this interesting webinar, which is basically trying to uh, you know, present the findings from very empirical studies uh, on farm ponds. We have about three, four presentations, and they are going to be very short uh, presentations. The first one is by Ankita Yadav and Sarida Chemburkar, and they are going to present, I mean, the title is A Deep Dive into Farm Ponds in Maharashtra, the Intended and the Actual. So this is uh, basically scenarios from six uh, villages where they did a micro very in-depth studies and things. So both Ankita and Sarita are young geologists and researchers uh, uh, in the WTR Center of Resilient Studies uh, based in Pune. So I think each of the, uh, I mean, all the presentations will be about 10 minutes each uh, so that we have some time later for discussions and things. So over to Ankita and Sarita. I think you are not audible, I think. Can everyone hear her? Ankita, you're not heard. You cannot be heard. Yes. We can't hear you. Oh. Now. Now it is OK. Now we are able to hear her. Hello. Yes, go ahead, Angita. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Joy, sir. Uh, and good afternoon, everyone. I'm Angita Yadav from WCRES. Uh, today, with my colleague, Sarita Chamburkar, I'm going to present our study uh, on different scenarios uh, in of farm ponds in six villages of Maharashtra. Uh, we are aware that state of Maharashtra is facing frequent droughts and drought-like conditions, erratic rainfall, and elongated dry spells in many regions of Maharashtra. These climatic externalities are putting tremendous pressure on agriculture productivity as well as on agrarian community uh, in terms of monetary uh, income. In order to cope with the challenging climatic scenarios, state government has been putting their best efforts to support agriculture and agrarian community to help elevate uh, farmers' quality of life. Farm ponds, farm ponds are one of such mitigation measure, uh, measures proposed by state government, uh, by uh, state government of Maharashtra early since 2009. And even before that, as mentioned by Dhaver sir. So what are farm ponds? Farm ponds are uh, traditionally the water harvesting structure as Sashi Shekhar has very nicely elaborated earlier. And uh, these structures are meant to be capturing uh, the surface runoff water and use, this water is used uh, as a protective irrigation during uh, dry spell. These uh, ponds are being observed across the country in different sizes and shapes. Their design purposes, as well as the type of usage 
also vary in different geographies. With the objective of drought mitigation and at the same time to increase farmers' income, state and central government have farm ponds, uh, farm ponds in Maharashtra through various subsidized schemes. The main purpose uh, of farm pond is to provide protective irrigation during uh, dry spills and also to reduce climatic vulnerability of agrarian commun community. The intended benefits are even more prominent that they, uh, which include the uh, increase in area under irrigation, increase in land productivity, and also the crop yield. If farm ponds are not lined, then there is a groundwater recharge. Also, farm ponds help in securing uh, yield of cash crops and horticulture, mm -hmm. and, there, uh, and therefore the monetary returns are assured. This eventually enhances the quality of life of farmers. Now we see and understand uh, the study that we have conducted in six villages in the rain shadow area of Maharashtra. The map shows the location of six villages, uh, which, is which are situated in the uh, Sangamnet block of Ahmednagar district. The picture on the right is taken on the field uh, where we have gone. The characteristics of farm ponds is seen very much that uh, this farm pond is without inlet and outlet. Uh, it is lined with plastic material, uh, which is impervious, and it is filled with groundwater. So these are the features of uh, farm ponds in a study area. Also, I would like to mention that this is uh, this farm pond is called as functional farm pond, as mentioned by local farmers. Uh, when there is there is a farm pond which is lined by uh, impervious material, it is called as functional farm pond. Uh, this study was initiated in 2016-17, uh, located in six villages of Ahmednagar. There were a total of 188 farm ponds constructed at the time, uh, out of which 68 farm ponds were functional. Uh, these were owned by 61 households. The table shows the uh, categorization of farm pond sizes across the land, hold uh, land holding of farmers. So there are total of 23 large farm ponds, 34 medium farm ponds, and 11 small farm ponds. With the household level data, we have calculated the net crop area uh, prior and post farm pond construction. The post farm pond uh, crop data is for 2016-17, while the pre farm pond crop data is adjusted for calendar year 2015 and 16. Since the farm ponds were constructed in different years between 2009 and 15, from the graph it is very clearly seen that the, uh, for summer and perennial crops, farm ponds are proven to be very beneficial intervention uh, since there is an increase in area under crop. Uh, cultivation, uh, which provides you the assured irrigation facility. But also for Kharif and Rabi season, you can see there is an increase, uh, uh, increase in area under cultivation, uh, apart from securing their uh, crops of Kharif and Rabi. So with, uh, with this, I would like to invite my colleague Sarita so that she will continue with the slides. Thank you, Ankita, and good afternoon, everyone. Until now, we have talked about the background of the farm ponds, the purpose, and the benefits. Now it is time to look at the different scenarios of the farm pond that we have observed in the study area. So looking at the scenario one, it talks about the simple farm pond, as you can see in the Google image on the left, in which the farmer is lifting water from the bore well and filling it in the farm pond. And the depth of the bore well is 154.2 meters. And the surface area of the farm pond is 841 meters square. And the total area under cultivation is 182 hectares. So the farmer in this area cultivates different crops such as bajra, groundnut, chickpea, and wheat. So this is the actual practice of farm pond observed in a study area where they have converted it into the uh, storage tank. Now moving to the second scenario, as you can see in the Google image, 
farm ponds are adjacent to each other and the source is nearby so in this case uh, the owner one has two farm ponds whereas the other owner has only single farm pond and as a water source both the farmer use bore well to fill in the farm ponds the total area under irrigation of both the farmer is 2.85 hectares as you can see in the schematic diagram bore well 1 and bore well 2 are owned by owner 1 whereas borewell 3 is owned by border uh, owner 2 so and the depth of the borewell is uh, 106.7 meters so when the borewell 1 is used to fill the farm pond it creates a cone of depression as you can see in the diagram we have shown it which has the influence on the borewell 2 with regards to water fluctuation we have validated this by doing the pumping test Uh, now in the scenario three, this is the huge farm pond, which is about one acre in size, and this farmer uses three sources of water to fill his farm pond. What he does, he pumps water from both the bore wells and store it in the dug well. So this dug well is a storage well, as you can see in the diagram. And from this uh, dug well, he lifts water and fills his farm pond. He has total area of fifteen point thirty eight acres. and out of which 8.10 hectares are under horticulture where he grows mango pomegranate custard apple where the other other seasonal crops so on the right hand side is the elevation profile in which you can see that due to the huge size of farm, uh, farm pond large quantum of water is lifted and if the aquifer continues in the downstream village boundary then the impact of over pumping will eventually affect the downstream aquifer but the intensity of impact is still unknown which requires depth study to decipher the subsurface condition uh, moving to the fourth scenario this farm pond is located at a higher elevation in the village one and it draws water from the dug well one which is located in the downstream village so in the so the distance from the down uh, dug well to the farm pond is approx uh, 636 meters and this farmer has almost four dug wells that is located in the downstream village and he also have horizontal dug well which taps the surrounding water so we have found that in this village there are deepest uh, bore uh, dug well that is 27.4 meters so uh, this farmer in order to fill the farm pond he has to lift water against the gravity which requires a lot of investment cost and energy consumption so this was about the different scenarios now as you can see so in order to fill the 68 farm ponds total 87 water sources were lifted in the pie diagram as you can see the, there are uh, 40 bore wells uh, 39 dug wells and eight streams and the table above we have categorized the farm pond in three categories like large medium and small so in order to fill the 23 farm ponds there are 13 dug wells bore uh, 16 bore wells and two three streams the farm ponds have been filled whereas a small farm pond has a volume of 6148 uh, meter cube and 13 dug wells nine bore wells and one streams are been used and there are also 13 uh, horizontal wells we have observed in the dug well now we will have a closer look at the investment cost so to construct the farm pond the government provides uh, funding through different scheme so in the table as you can see we have categorized it in a three different categories so almost 91% of funding of is done by the own fund whereas only 9% is done by the uh, received from the government scheme and the total investment cost is approx 2 crores 80 lakhs thank you yeah uh thanks uh, uh, ankit and sarida i think both of you together have been able to bring out uh, very nuanced uh, understanding about uh, the different types of uh, farm ponds the different scenarios and the practices uh, around that uh, from your study area of six villages um Uh, now we move to the second uh, short presentation that is by dr taufik wasi and uh, vijay solanki and uh, in fact they are going to touch upon the hydrogeological findings and impacts in this uh, six uh, study villages 
Dr. Taufik has a PhD in uh, geophysics and Vijay has a background in geoinformatics and both are researchers with WTR. So it's over to Taufik and uh, Vijay. About 10 minutes, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, um, uh, thank you, Joy sir. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, myself, Taufik Wasi. Along with me is uh, Vijay Solanki. Till now, we have uh, seen the socioeconomic aspect of farm ponds. Now, we'll have a closer look of hydrogeological findings in the farm pond scenario. So, uh, in order to fill the farm ponds, uh, farmers extract huge quantum of water from the extracted structure in terms of bore wells and dug wells. As a result, a local cone of depression uh, form which influences the surrounding wells under zone of influence. So uh, to demarcate the zone of influence, several wells were selected around the pumping well and subsequently in situ parameters in terms of electrical conductivity, pH, TDS, salinity and temperature were analyzed. And if you see the like the idea behind measuring these parameters uh, was to understand the dilution of solids away from the pumping well and eventually demarcate the zone where the dilution effect ends. A breakthrough curve was generated also uh, using in situ parameters with respect to the distance of observation well uh, from the pumping well, which finally reveals the impact uh, around the pumping well. Now coming to the um, next slide. We have taken the Google image to make it more lucid. This is the case study of one farm pond where uh, like you can see the farm pond, uh, all the uh, farm pond is located uh, near the hill, foothill and uh, an elevation profile was also generated to understand the topographical difference um, uh, across the wells and identifying the location of farm pond. Um, in this case scenario, the farm pond owner is lifting water from dug well, uh, which is situated around a 254 meter downslope of the farm pond, which you can see in the uh, elevation profile. As a result of pumping of source well, the influence can be seen on the surrounding three wells, which is falling in the zone and readily goes like 130 meter from the source well. Coming to the table, <clears throat> uh, this is the statistical data acquired from the field. As we can see, the table conclude the total number of farm pond uh, non-farm pond uh, household and the uh, and the wells which are coming uh, within the zone of influence. As we can see, a total of 41 farm pond owners are affecting 68 non-farm pond households uh, who are having 84 water sources uh, within the zone of influence. It has been observed that the water availability of 50 wells have been reduced by three months, whereas 23 wells are showing the reduction of uh, one month. Coming to the next. Yeah. Now, um, yeah, talking about the frequency in the first table, it optimizes the frequency of farm pond uh, filling on annual basis, where the frequency varies from one to 30 times depending upon the size of farm pond. As per the frequency of filling total volume of water, um, it has been calculated on annual basis and it was found that like 26.7 lakh cubic meter water is being lifted by 61 households and uh, this will be equal to like 2 lakh 67 uh, thousand tankers. Yeah, so <clears throat> in this section we have used um, like artificial recharge zone map generated by GSDA and all the farm bonds um, under study is superimposed on the map. So like the map is mainly categorized into three sections where you can see the blue color indicate the high priority recharge zone, yellow showing moderate priority recharge zone and orange shows limited scope. So um, in the study village two, out of uh, 34, 34 farm ponds, there are 16 farm ponds uh, like which are falling on a high priority recharge zone. And simultaneously there are 26 uh, dug wells and bow wells which are tapping water to fill the farm pond from the same zone. So uh, you can see huge quantum of water is being like pumped from the high priority recharge zone, which makes the situation more worst. It has been observed that 13.54 uh, hectare area is covered by impervious land farm ponds falling in a high and moderate priority recharge zones. Since the, since the farm pond are lined with uh, impervious layer, so it blocks 
the water from infiltration, uh, which in turn hamper the recharge rate uh, in the respective zone. Now over to Vijay. Thank you, Taufik. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Vijay Solanki. So I will be presenting the remaining uh, slides of this presentation. So as you have already seen the distribution of compound in our six study villages. Go to the next slide. Yes. So as you, you all have seen the distribution of compound in the study villages, uh, there are the yellow color, the yellow color uh, villages which you see on the right hand side map, these are our six study villages and uh, the other villages are the neighboring villages. As GSDA has declared the Sangamnir block of Ahmednagar district as over exploited, so we thought to investigate the situation of farm pound in the neighboring geographies. So uh, we created a nine by nine kilometer grid for this purpose. And uh, in this grid, nine by nine kilometer grid, 34 villages were falling, uh, which covers uh, around 41,610 hectare of area. So you can see in these 34 villages, there are around 1,453 farm pond. And especially uh, in few villages, the density of farm ponds is uh, very huge. Uh, like in this North Central village, if you can see on the top, and even in the right hand side uh, village, the density is very huge of this farm pond. Next. Uh, we have also analyzed the temporal changes in the uh, cropped and cultivated area with respect to the farm ponds. Wherever the farm ponds are constructed, then we analyzed uh, what are the changes in the uh, cultivated area using satellite images. So for this purpose, we have used uh, Sentinel uh, satellite images of four years, uh, 2015, 16, 18, and 21. All four, for all four years, we have uh, considered only the rubby season because farm ponds are supposed to provide the irrigation in rubby season more. So uh, out of these four years, two years are drought year, uh, 2015 and uh, 2018, and two years, 2016 and 21 are the normal rainfall year. So these two years um, in 2015 and 18, you see in this map, the yellow circle, uh, the yellow pins are the locations of the farm pond. And these red patches in this uh, map are representing the agricultural area or the cropped area. So even in the drought year, the cropped area is very clearly visible, which means the farmers are able to take the crops in the rubby season in a drought year, after a drought year. So, but uh, this is one aspect of looking at it. Uh, but when we uh, when we see it from where they are filling it, as we have seen in the previous slide, so uh, these farm pond are being filled from the groundwater, uh, even in the drought year. So and uh, you know in the drought year the, there are more evaporation losses also. So this is one aspect which we have investigated. Now uh, to put it all together, the study of these six villages. Next. Yeah, to put it uh, all together, the study of these six villages, uh, we have analyzed the impacts on various verticals. So first major impact is on the recharge of the groundwater. So in these six study villages, uh, there are 178 impervious farm pond, which occupy 13.54 hectare of area under the high and moderate priority recharge zones. And Within this uh, recharge zone area only, there are additional bore well and dug wells also, which are uh, extracting the water. So it is not only uh, that the farm ponds uh, lined with the plastic or the impervious line are blocking the recharge in this very high and uh, moderate private recharge zone. It is also tapping and extracting the water through the bore wells and dug wells. The second impact is on the evaporation, evaporation loss, which is we have calculated to approximately 6.67 lakh uh, meter cube of this uh, 68 farm pond. And this, if we convert, uh, which comes to a significant number of 66.7 thousand tankers of water uh, of 10,000 liter capacity each. 
uh, under the social and uh, economic uh, uh, losses, there are 68 farm pounds which belongs to 61 household which lived approximately 26.7 lakh cubic meter of groundwater annually. And this is a huge uh, amount. The sources which are mainly the bore well of 41 farm pound owner, these are negatively impacting the bore well and dug well of 68 non farm pound owner, as well as uh, their wells are uh, located in the zone of influence of the source well. And, and unknown number of households having the bore well and dug well are also affected, which are uh, situated in the downstream, which is here a common aquifer. So with this, uh, I would like to end my presentation. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Taufik and uh, Vijay. Perfect in terms of timing. And also, I think you could bring in a whole lot of uh, very nuanced understanding of the hydrogeological uh, issues related to its impact. And I think your uh, presentation clearly brings out both the sustainability and the equity issues related to this. I was just wondering whether you also looked at uh, the energy required or the energy used in pumping, because that can be an important parameters as part of the study. Probably you could come back to that uh, later. Now sure. we move to the yeah we move to the third presentation uh, by Dr. Pooja Prasad. In fact, uh, she is going to zoom out of the six villages of the micro level studies which WTI did, and try to uh, try to give us a big picture. So a big picture view of farm ponds in Maharashtra and its uh, you know, impact. So Pooja Prasad is a postdoc in the land and water department at the IHA Delft. Recently, Pooja has been awarded for her thesis in quotes, agricultural intensification and risk in water constrained regions, a socio-ecological systems analysis of horticulture cultivation in Maharashtra. And her presentation is going to be based on this. So first of all, congratulations, Pooja, and uh, over to you. About 10 minutes, yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. I hope I'm audible and that I hope you can also see my uh, my PowerPoint presentation. Yes, both, both are okay, yeah. Okay, perfect. Yeah. So uh, I'm just going to adjust this. Um, okay, well, thank you very much, first of all, for having me here today. Uh, I'm honored to present my, uh, my research here, which is going to be, uh, on the impact and use of farm ponds in Maharashtra, a more zoomed out view. Uh, okay, my screen is not moving for some reason. Um, yeah, so um, here I want to start with a, a slide which shows pictures of different types of farm ponds as we've been talking about that there are different uh, types and uses of farm ponds. Here we see some are dug out ponds, some are the elevated ponds, which are the focus of our discussion today. These lined uh, farm ponds, which are used uh, to, um, to support horticulture uh, with, and are filled with groundwater. So I'm going to focus uh, on, the, um, on these plastic lined groundwater filled farm ponds. And we know, and as we've already heard today, that there are contradictory narratives about this. There are um, numerous success stories that we all know about. Um, Karvanshi was mentioned uh, by uh, Sri Eknar Davle just now about how farm ponds actually enhance farmer incomes and uh, especially for horticulture and increase their drought resilience. At the same time, we've also seen presentations like the ones just made, which highlight the unsustainability of, uh, of the farm ponds with respect to the use of groundwater and the, in increase, uh, and the increase in inequity. So my focus has been in trying to understand, okay, how do we put these uh, sort of different contradictory narratives together to understand the system in a more holistic manner um, so that we are not looking at sustainability or profitability in isolation, uh, but can we consider how they are interconnected, how profitability, equity, and sustainability are interconnected in the system and how they change over time. And uh, to do that, I use a system dynamic study um, which uh, which uses uh, which analyzes the interconnections between different stocks and flows uh, of the system. Uh, it analyzes the different feedbacks that happens between actors. So when there are uh, farm pond owning farmers, non farm pond owning fa farmers, what is the interaction between them? How decision of one influences the other, and so on, and how the system over time changes. Um, and this work is based on extensive fieldwork done by me and my uh, colleagues um, 
but I, I in in interest of time, I'm not going to go into the field uh, details as it was already um, much has been said about this already. So I'm going to dive right into the system dynamic uh, study uh, itself. And the first part of it is a, a qualitative description of the structure uh, that drives farm pond mm -hmm. construction. So if we uh, try to understand from the farmer's point of view, if we ask the farmers, okay, what is the reason for what drives their decision to invest in farm ponds? Uh, this causal loop diagram kind of shows what are the different feedback loops uh, or, or driving mechanisms. The first one of them, I call it an aspirational intensification. Or the, the, uh, it is the aspiration of the farmer uh, because of which they choose to invest in farm ponds because uh, they want to grow horticulture crops and benefit from the um, profitability that it offers. And when these farmers are successful, looking at them, there are more farmers who are motivated to also uh, build farm ponds and grow orchards. So this is this creates a positive feedback, uh, which leads to uh, an increase in number of farm ponds. So after some initial farm ponds are created, more farm ponds are therefore created based on this. But as this happens, and there's more area under orchards, it leads to more groundwater demand. And we have seen how these farm ponds also lead to high evaporation loss. So there's more stress on groundwater, as we know it's a common pool resource, which then impacts the non-farm pond owning farmers. And it triggers this other cycle, uh, which I call the vulnerability induced investment in farm ponds. So if I ask many of the farmers will, all, will say that the reason they have invested in farm ponds is because uh, you know, until a few years ago, they had water in their wells sufficient to uh, give full irrigation to their uh, their uh, rabi kanda or their wheat crop. But in, lately, in the last few years, they have fallen short of one or two irrigations and have experienced yield losses. And so now, in order to have assured irrigation, uh, they have no option but to invest in farm ponds. Sometimes al also by taking loans. So this is that vulnerability induced intensification, which 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 is driving. Those who are who are affected by uh, uh, increasing stress on groundwater to now also uh, invest in in uh, in creating farm ponds, which then further impacts the groundwater stress and creates this vicious cycle of uh, more and more farm ponds being created and more increasing groundwater stress. So this is sort of the qualitative view of the structure of the system that that is driving more and more farm pond construction and movement towards uh, greater intensification with horticulture. Uh, the same uh, sort of qualitative uh, syst uh, structure that we saw can now be simulated as a, a quantitative uh, stock in, uh, quantitative system dynamic model, which I show here. And the purpose of doing that is to see, okay, how does this uh, unravel over time? And how is it kind of limited by the biophysical attributes of, uh, of a particular system, of a particular village? Because clearly it has a certain uh, capacity of the aquifer, the shallow hard rock aquifer, and there are different rainfall patterns, sometimes a good year, sometimes a bad year. So how does it all come together uh, when, when we have a uh, um, you know, a hydrological system combined with a social system. So this is like a, a stock and flow diagram, a model uh, that has been built uh, for this. And what what I have here is basically um, a, a different, we can uh, introduce different rainfall patterns and based on the biophysical attributes of, uh, uh, of the region, there is certain groundwater uh, capacity, the aquifer capacity and say in this region, if we were to first start by introducing uh, say 10 farm ponds part of a government scheme, how does it then evolve? How does the system evolve in terms of, okay, uh, the change in the cropping pattern that results from the farm ponds, when that cropping pattern changes, how does that change the groundwater abstraction? How does it impact then the, sh the groundwater levels? How does it impact the profitability of the horticulture farmers as well as the non-horticulture farmers? Uh, and the groundwater risk or access for other farmers? And then how does that impact the decisions of other farmers to also um, uh, create new farm ponds? So this feedback is now incorporated in this model. And then I run this model to, to look at different scenarios to understand uh, what happens in the business as usual scenario. And I'm presenting uh, only a couple of scenarios from this. And what, um, what I basically want to highlight is that in, um, 
in a uh, in a typical village if if say in the first year uh, as part of a government program 10 farm ponds are introduced what this um, the the way the feedback loops operate we see that that one uh, introduction of farm ponds actually leads to an ever increasing uh, number of uh, investments in new farm ponds, first triggered by the aspiration of more farmers, and then uh, because of the vulnerability that more and more farmers start to invest, and we see a rapid increase uh, uh, over, a, over a period of time. And along with this, there is a change in the cropping pattern. So uh, initially, we may have had um, uh, only say about 50% area under rugby and no um, summer and uh, orchards. But over time, we see more and more area under orchards, some area which is also a summer uh, cropping and um, uh, yeah, and reduced area under um, um, under uh, just rugby cropping. So um, the more interesting part is here where we see okay what happens then to the groundwater behavior and the base flows. So uh, in the in the graph here, the red lines here depict the base flows. And um, uh, Sri Ekna Davle mentioned about the subsurface flows and the base flows. And so it's really interesting here that we see that as the number of farm ponds start to increase, we see the impact on base flows because that is what is actually filling up these ponds. And at a certain point, we see that these uh, base flows disappear as the number, number of farm ponds increase. Um, the blue line here, uh, shows the behavior of the groundwater, the, the well water level, which we also see that as there is more intensification and more farm ponds, the well levels start to um, sink deeper and deeper um, until there comes a time when the system can no longer support, the available groundwater can no longer support the crop water demand. And at, uh, so this is the, the carrying capacity of the system beyond which uh, uh, there is unmet demand. And, and this unmet demand is first experienced by those who have shallow wells or who depend on the shallow public drinking water wells. But as the groundwater situation worsens, uh, eventually everybody, including the horticulture farmers, are impacted by this. And what we also see here is in terms of profitability. So if we, if we now look at how the overall system profitability is, which includes uh, the, the profitability of the orchards, uh, growing farmers, as well as those who are only growing two crops, uh, we see that initially with the increase in the number of farm ponds, there is a steady increase in profitability, mainly driven by the horticulture farmers. But after that carrying capacity is exceeded, there's actually a, a decrease in profitability. So it's no longer even profitable to continue having more farm ponds and to continue having uh, uh, more intensification of agriculture. Um, and, and this uh, loss in profit is actually also seen by horticulture farmers. So um, what this shows is that once this carrying capacity is breached, it leads to a tragedy of the commons in which everybody, not just the non-farm pound owning farmers, but even those who have invested in it are going to be much worse off. Now, in, in this particular scenario, at, uh, in, in this case, I haven't yet introduced droughts, the impact of droughts, just to show, uh, just to be able to isolate what happens just because of the farm ponds. But if we actually were to introduce uh, droughts in every, you know, uh, uh, say here uh, in the circled year, I show the number of uh, the years in which we introduce droughts. We What this shows is that with the droughts, uh, they actually lower the, the carrying capacity, right? So if, if it's a drought year, the amount of groundwater stored in my aquifer is actually going to be much lower and it's going to be able to support much less uh, intensification. So even with a low level of intensification, we see that the system tips over and there is a rapid escalation in, in the number of uh, farm ponds. So this is a stylized model, but I think there's a, there are some really uh, important learnings that we can have from from this and uh, uh, the implications. Would you just a minute or two? Yeah, I'm just on my uh, yeah. last two or three slides. So the implications here uh, are that first, uh, in the short term, we find that yes, farm ponds do shield the early adopters, the farmers who start early with the, the farm ponds from droughts. However, it triggers a vicious cycle of new farm pond creation and increasing groundwater stress for everybody, including the horticulture farmers. So the key question, which was also asked earlier, is that, okay, so is there a limit? What is the sustainable limit for intensification? Can we define this? Uh, 
Now, sustainable intensification inherently means that we always stay below the resource threshold, but this th resource threshold it is not fixed and that is what makes it complicated that in this shallow hard rock aquifers it is very variable with good year and bad rainfall years so it's actually not possible to have one fixed uh, golden sort of number which remains sustainable uh, no matter what kind of rainfall we have but instead what is possible is that we adopt we have an adaptive strategy strategy which is based on a seasonal carrying capacity. Mm -hmm. So if we are able to know what is my seasonal, uh, my carrying capacity for this season, then we can decide, okay, can, can I fill farm ponds in this season and make use of those base flows? But if there are no base flows, then it does not make sense to fill those farm ponds. So, uh, however, this is very contradictory actually to the current use and market incentives, uh, which actually incentivize use of farm ponds only in drought years. Mm. And uh, this also uh, suggests that we need to move towards seasonally adaptive intensification. That is, we make use of good rainfall years. We grow tomatoes and horticulture in those years. But in bad rainfall years, we step back and we grow drought resilient crops. And what this means is that we must avoid being logged into uh, a specific irrigation demand. And, and especially what it means is that we must stand against multi-year orchards in um, in these regions which have very variable carrying capacity because it locks you into uh, having to irrigate the orchards year after year, round the year for multiple years, which farmers will irrigate no matter whether it's a bad year or, or good year. And so you're not able to stay within the carrying capacity. I just want to end with a couple of slides on the way forward. This is work done, uh, being done by uh, some of my colleagues uh, in the IIT Bombay Pokra team. Um, which they are doing closely with the government of Maharashtra and in trying to um, develop these seasonal carrying capacity maps, which can be used by the, the village Krishi Sahayak along with the villagers to hold uh, a Rabi Hangam Baithak uh, and see, okay, what is the seasonal carrying capacity for this season? And then uh, together be able to decide, okay, what is the uh, what could be a possible adaptive cropping pattern for this? So, for example, this is a, a such a map for Sengao Taluka in, in Hingoli, where you can see in the upstream part, uh, the rabi carrying capacity, and this is for current rainfall year, is 129 millimeter. And in the downstream part, we see 251 millimeter. For the same reason, region, if you look at 2018 rainfall for a uh, low rainfall year, we see how that carrying capacity actually changes. Uh, it, it can be different for different years. And that's why there's a need uh, to then, uh, before every rabbi uh, uh, sowing, to have this hung, rabbi hangam baithak and sit and say, okay, this, uh, this season, our carrying capacity, for example, if it's 129 millimeter, what does it mean for my cropping pattern? Maybe if I have two acre, I can do 100%, you know, sow all two acres with just fodder crop. If I want to do harbara, sow only 50% of my area. Or if I want to do uh, Rabi Kanda, then only do it in one fifth of my area, right? And in a good rainfall year, I could even aim to grow tomatoes. If I want to store some part of this water in a farm pond, uh, as long as I stay within my 250 millimeter entitlement, which is the carrying capacity for that season, then I'm, I'm not affecting other people, right? So that is that could be one approach to go ahead. And we hope that government of Maharashtra will uh, we'll come up with this GR on Rabi Hangam Baithak, uh, just as uh, now there is a GR for Kharif Hangam Baithak also, and, and that this work can go forward. Uh, lastly, this, this is my last slide. I just want to have one advertisement for oh. uh, this particular work, also done by my colleagues uh, on Gram Trishtri, which is a, an open source online system for detection of minor irrigation structures in, in any village. So for all the researchers out there, all of uh, you who are working on this, please, I invite you to, to access this website. It can, uh, you can use this to use satellite images for any area to detect wells, farm ponds, uh, um, check dams, and it can also differentiate between lined farm ponds, unlined farm ponds, filled or empty farm ponds. So uh, I invite you to please um, use this. So that is the end of my talk. Thank you for the opportunity. Yeah, thanks, Pooja. Very interesting presentation. I'm very sorry that uh, to rush you through because the time constraints, I think you needed much more time to actually explain out that type of new concepts and the framework you brought into the uh, discussion. I think it's very interesting to see how you connected um, the whole question of sustainability, equity, and profitability uh, to the 
biophysical boundary conditions that exist in the region or in a place or in a village and things. And then try to look at the carrying capacity, the tipping point of that. And also bringing this whole idea about adaptive strategy based on seasonal carrying capacity, which has tremendous impact on the type of crop choices you make. So I think it's very interesting. I think we should make this as uh, part of, I would uh, request Marcella to have a little more discussion on this, maybe later as a follow-up to this. And thanks, thanks a lot to bring into this. So next, I think we move yes. to the last presentation. Yeah, uh, Joy, Marcella, I have a... Yeah. Yes. Oh, okay, yes. Uh, yes, yeah, sorry. Uh, yeah. I just got a call from uh, Dr. Nirmalia Chaudhary. He's oh. having difficulty in connecting. And oh. so he has been struggling for some time. So. Uh, to everyone, apologies. He is unable to participate because of connectivity issues. And he okay. would have been talking about the experiences in Jharkhand. But we hope we'll get something from him a little later to share with you all. Mm -hmm. So apologies to everyone for this. And uh, yeah, that's fine. Yes. Yeah. Yes, yes. So then we can move to the next uh, segment, uh, which I think I would invite uh, Dr. Dipangasar to moderate. Yeah. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Joy. Uh, now, you know, now we were in the, in the, in the deep, deep dive research, I will say, on the, on the farm pond. Uh, so four very enriching uh, experience, uh, enriching uh, research that has been taken place. Uh, very new insight in how the farm ponds are working technically, scientifically, uh, uh, considering their economy, considering their social issues. Now we are entering into another section of the webinar where we'll take a wide spectrum view from some of the senior persons. So the initial idea was to take a view from a very seasoned bureaucrat come policymaker, Dr. Sashi Shekhar, then another person who is responsible for regulating the groundwater resource in India, Chairman Central Groundwater Authority, then another person from the from the agency who supports financially for development of water resource, agriculture, irrigation, that is NABARD. And then from the academics, very, very important how they uh, feel about it and what is their, uh, what are their thoughts. So Dr. Sashi Shekhar has already, because of his some urgent engagement, he has shared his view and he has already left. Now I will invite uh, Sri Sunil Kumar uh, Chairman, Central Groundwater Authority and Central Groundwater Board, board to, for his view, Mr. Sunil Kumar, uh, he is a product of IIT Rurki and uh, he is in the command of the, I would say, the largest groundwater department in the world, Central Groundwater Board, and also very, very tough task of uh, regulating the groundwater resource of India, very, very uh, sensitive uh, work, I will say, and very, very tough work. So we are eager to hear Sunil Kumar sir. Please. So very good afternoon to everybody. Thank you, Tipankasa sir. First of all, let me extend my gratitude to Dr. Marcella D'Souza, Director WTR, and Sasa, my former boss in the department, mentor, who actually taught us many things how to go ahead with the regulation, then aquifer mapping, understanding of the hydrogeology of the country. I have learned a lot from him. I think something is missing. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes, we can. <clears throat> so, uh, it's my pleasure uh, to express my view on this platform regarding the farm pound issues. And uh, I heard the experts, Sajjajagar Saab, who was the, our former secretary, and uh, his authority on groundwater and involved in many of the policy making document of the government of India. Just we heard the three uh, researchers who are really doing excellent work in the field of uh, the farm ponds, their impact on the hydrogeology, sociology, and the social side of the hydrogeology. They are really working very hard and very good what they are doing. So I congratulate them for their work. 
Uh, I have a small presentation and uh, it's a uh, four or five slides and most of them uh, you already know, but let us have a uh, discussion on those parts. So um, we all know that they, in the Renfield area, they contribute about 55% of the... Break up, break up. They contribute the about 50% of the cultivated area of the country and about 40% of the food grain comes from this area. And uh, through these Renfield area, 60% of the livestock are supported. And uh, um, basically, as Sir has told, that the farm pond objective was basically to provide the supplementary irrigation to increase the crop production and the uh, and not to store the water on the surface of the uh, ground. So there are various type of ponds, and we are talking the second one highlighted as yellow. And I was just going through the uh, chat. And some of the people has really nicely discussed this thing and then they were telling that actually these are not actually the farm ponds. Basically, these are the storage tank. And uh, the basic objective before the farm ponds or the philosophy behind the farm ponds are basically to have a, a structure which can store the excess runoff which was going just away from the fields during the rainy season. So basically to capture whatever water was going as waste or into the rivers, we were supposed to capture that. But actually in this process of uh, making a pond uh, and then uh, putting a polythene under this or making it concretize, basically what we are doing, we are basically uh, stopping the downward movement of the water and putting up a lot of stress on the groundwater. So, Actually, the expectation from the farm pond were basically to have a protective and supplementary irrigation. And in some, some of the area like coastal areas to provide the, the aquaculture and then conserve the natural resources like soil and nutrients to arrest the runoff and controlling the flood in a little way and have a rainwater oh. harvesting promoted in those areas so that groundwater become more recharged and the resources improve. So now with the existing practice, when we are going uh, with a surface pond, which are actually basically not the farm pond, it's storage tanks. I have also seen few of them while coming from Pune to Delhi in a train. So I have seen them that basically these are the structures, not dug, basically they are on the surface of the earth and then with the bunding, uh, they are putting a large uh, polythene and the HDAP also some different type of material. And ultimately, basically, they are storing the rainwater, sorry, they're storing the groundwater through pumping. And uh, during this process, as the earlier researcher has told, that slowly, slowly water level are going down. So they are also going down and down and deeper fractures. They are basically uh, tapping to fetch more and more water. And because these are hard rocks, so they, talk, they take actually longer to recharge them also. And with, with the depth, the availability of water is also uh, decreases. So in case we are going deep and deep, uh, ultimately what will happen, we will not get the water. And with this process, the, the problem is actually uh, further amplified because the agriculture extraction groundwater is not regulated under the existing law. And the other law which says the, uh, the easement act has got certain uh, uh, certain rules under which you cannot take out the unlimited water from the from your plot because the groundwater flows in a defined channel. So you can have only a limited amount of water. You can draw a limited amount of water from the your uh, uh, field to fill that storage. But what we are doing basically we are taking out the resource of the other farmers by extending the area of influence of the uh, these, these wells which are pumping out the water. And through this, basically we are not improving the sustainability issue, rather we are further deteriorating this issue and sustainability issue in the, especially in the hard rock area is a major issue and which is being actually uh, becoming more and more worse. And because we do not have very uh, 
very uh, what do you call the very intense monitoring or very dense monitoring so these things are not picked up in a uh, regional network so these hotspots are not picked up so they cannot be actually basically shown to the government these are the area where more efforts need to be taken at the policy level so like the uh, everybody is taking out large, like the larger farmers they are taking out more and more water so we need a policy intervention to uh, at least to restrict them to a to a level that how much they are permitted to extract because ultimately the 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 the, the objective of the uh, water resources protection having a aviral dhara that is basically lost we are basically reducing the base flow and ultimately what will happen that our rivers are getting dried uh, lots of water is being evaporated from these ponds and because these are the water stressed area one of the researchers also also mentioned this thing so basically we are approximately 25 to 20 30% we are wasting few uh, farm ponds have been which have been created near the coastal area they are actually taking the water from the sea and mixing it with, it with the ground water so basically ultimately some of the water is actually going down and that water is basically uh, deteriorating the quality of the ground water making it more saline so uh, if you see a statistics the a small farmer and the marginal farmer they are more than 98% and only 2 to 3% farmers they are the large farmers which are basically uh, uh, basically uh, digging up or the, uh, using these farm ponds to use the water so basically we are depriving the farmers up to a level of say 92% and this is going to have a major uh, conflict uh, conflict place for the between the farmers those are having farm pond and those no, do not have the farm ponds so there are few uh, examples like aquaculture in andhra pradesh as i was telling near the coastal area they are having the farm ponds for aquaculture and through this they are mixing the groundwater which is uh, they are uh, pumping out and this is causing two impact one is the groundwater ingress from the the sea water ingress from the sea side as well as the upcooling of the uh, the saline water interface through because lot of water is being withdrawn quality is deteriorated so uh, this also we need to think of and other thing which i forgot to mention quality of the water in few places like uh, in uh, karnataka one experimental study has been taken up by the government to use the farm pond as a um, recharge ponds and using the sewage water and uh, cgwb and cgwa we are trying to have a common guidelines wherein the uh, quality parameters will be fixed along with the other, other participant other other uh, stakeholders consultation then we will only tell the, that these are the parameters and uh, use that uh, quality water should be used for uh, recharging the sewage water or the grey water to the ground water so uh, basically i see the three things in the farm pond issue one is the uh, those ponds should not be those ponds should not be filled with the uh, ground water pumps second the ponds near the coastal area Uh, should not be mixed with the water of uh, the the ground water and third one the quality of the water used for recharging the uh, recharging the sea, using the sewage water recharge water should be at least the tertiary type of water we are making lines of it so that should also be taken care of so that's what uh, from my side what i want to tell thank you very much for giving me this opportunity thank you very much thank you sunil sir for uh, highlighting some issues in fact uh, there are uh, as it appears there are many issues uh, related to farm pond though we are primarily focusing on the low rainfall area underlain by hard rock aquifers but as he is uh, highlighting that in the coastal areas also there are issues in the 
in the areas where they are trying to use some compounds for using recharge and using the treated wastewater as a source water. So there are many issues and many, and we need further discussions on that. I find many interesting questions in the chat box. I will request Dr. Marcila that some of the question, very interesting questions and there some participants are really interested. So let there be some discussion at least some of the questions can be taken in the discussion. Now with this, I will now invite our next speaker. Thank you, Sunil Sab again you, uh, for sir. your uh, uh, nice presentation. The next presentation is by uh, Sri C. A. Sar Murthy. He is the Chief General Manager NABARD. You all know the NABARD is spearheading the agricultural irrigation development in India, spending a lot of money, a lot of thoughts, a lot of wisdom for uh, taking ahead our agriculture, uh, irrigation, and also the water uh, resource sector in India forward. So now I will, with this, I will request Murthy Sab to share his view. He is Chief General Manager, uh, Nabard. Murthy Sab, please. Yeah, Namaskar to everyone. And uh, at the outset, uh, thank uh, the organizer, Dr. Marcella, for uh, extending invite to us. Uh, personally, I've been uh, uh, greatly benefited uh, with the technical presentations and the views of the uh, Secretary of Government of Maharashtra and uh, Chairman uh, Central Ground Water Board. Uh, so we got the benefit of uh, uh, wisdom uh, from the experts. And uh, have, uh, one good thing is that happened, like Marcella shared uh, that uh, some of the papers uh, which have been published. Uh, so I'm happy I read all those papers. So the meeting is quite uh, well prepared uh, for this meeting. Uh, well, first thing is a brief uh, outset. Uh, uh, we threw out watershed. It's almost a uh, three decade old experience. Uh, invested roughly 2,000 crore odd, then 2.5 million hectares and 2.5 lakh compounds we have invested. Therefore, subject definitely this uh, uh, this is a, a practice. I will not. I don't want to label it as a very hard. I don't want to use any hard words. This kind of a practice certainly it is uh, brought to the attention of uh, head office what we should do in under these circumstances. Uh, that is our question mark. Then uh, the, uh, what, what, we, what we understand is, I'm also a horticulturist, and I happen to be there in the, uh, in the senior level meetings at Delhi. So uh, when, I looked at, when I looked at the papers, how horticulturist, how horticulture sector, because normally I also, when you sit it, we would like to push a diversification, farm incomes, farm pub, Farm profitability and uh, how our profitability diversification is supported by uh, various incentives. Uh, of course, most of the incentives, as they rightly said, it came incentives came from uh, the MDH incentives uh, scheme also there. So when I was reading it's probably directly or indirectly, probably horticulture the sector as a whole, uh, uh, directly causing this kind of an externality, especially in the states like Maharashtra. The point is this: when we are looking at the at the national level, when we sit. At the daily level, when we sit, all the experts would sit. Probably when we are uh, channelizing it, when we are prioritizing it, when we are rationalizing the budgets, probably we'll have a uh, time, a occasion to pass, to review, to reflect what is happening in. And uh, next, probably there will be a kind of a mid course uh, correction, which is definitely is possible. That's all we go when we meet at uh, Delhi, uh, hopefully, the next uh, review meeting, which is happens, convened by. Uh, secretary, staff. This is one policy prescription to us. We carry feedback to Delhi as well. Uh, second one is a very interesting uh, debate uh, for me. This uh, there are uh, two opposite kind of a uh, uh, thing. When we push even from horticulture side, we push for uh, farm profitability. There is other dimensions which is coming from the as Dr. Puja has pointed out. That is, uh, it, it is become a competitive investment at the community level. They both are uh, different dimensions. Then the other dimension is. If you more look at the intensification, then uh, intensification more use of groundwater, and uh, you are on the hand, you are on the dimensions coming at it is impacting at the uh, at the community level. So there are only two dimensions. If you oh, it's a farm farm the farmer decision, farm level decisions, and are impacted the community. So there are only two uh, contradictory dimensions. How we would like to handle these two dimensions? For example, if a farmer if now, one more interesting thing is this, most of the investment has made by the farmers. Maybe it's coming from there through equity from their side, 
own contribution from their side, it has to come from the bank loan side. The moment if the these investments are supplied a bank loan, definitely profitability would put into the picture. However, we call it the community has to make a decision, community has to rationalize it, community has to make a adaptive kind of a, say, a cropping pattern based on the natural resource stock which is available. This is the one thing which is ideally we are expected to do, which has happened to do, which are we expect from the ideal watershed development program. The moment if a profitability is taken to the picture, investments also comes into the picture, uh, how a community can uh, uh, collectively enforce uh, such kind of a uh, decision making, uh, 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 that is a big question mark. In fact, water budgeting still we are struggling. And we are not sure that we are not uh, perfected the water budgeting, though we are talking about it, we have used it in the capacity of the communities. Still, sustainability is on this water trend, still we are struggling it. One more, uh, one more uh, uh, to our uh, today's my other, uh, I was discussing with my colleague. Uh, this lecture added one more uh, kind of a uh, layer of a problem to our sustainability issues. We are already sustaining it with demand water resources there. Crop diversification happens and the post watershed interventions. You know, you know the what kind of a how sustainability is the biggest issue. Now uh, this investment, the moment the water is available. Then, uh, then, uh, then again, we want a farm pond constructed, which we have no control over it. Though we are not explicitly, we are nowhere supporting that kind of intervention. Mostly our investments are uh, uh, surface flow control only, basically. But farmers do tend it. So bringing the, our entire uh, investments to the ground, that is the one kind of a red flag to us also. Having uh, set concerns to us that now there are very interesting points have come out. One hand, science is there. Science is coming from out from uh, uh, IIT. Then the practitioners are there from water where we began our journey. Uh, then uh, uh, that regulators, Central Ground Water Board, and uh, supplies of uh, money. We are so how we sit together. How do we? Uh, how do we? Uh, 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 how they carry the uh, the collective responsibility of the maintain the so-called equilibrium. I mean, I will say that don't do it and don't say do it. So that is not an issue. I will not go to debate it. But we have got a responsibility of to maintain the equilibrium. How do we enforce it? Once one suggestion came out is this equilibrium has to come out. Uh, communities have to be actively involved. Then water budgeting part, rationing part, science has to be taught, carrying capacity has to be taught, and the structures have to be taught. This is one way of soft kind of intervention. One has to come from the community side. Second side is this. Uh, that also has to come that the regulatory side that uh, for example regulatory side i would bring uh, uh, earlier yes yes still it's continued to be the one regulatory clauses which we put to our bankers that if it is in a over expected areas banks shall not finance any structure which is going to deplete the groundwater resource this is a kind of a negative covenant it is there now looking at uh, today's uh, uh, point again i need to have a lots many confirmations of course from the uh, kind of a vice council from Central Groundwater Board, what we would say, can there is one question mark is there in our mind, can we add another clause stating that in war exploited zones, such as which is Sangunar, which has been done, even though uh, we are not adding, farm pond is a very innocuous structure, it obviously not just now what it looks, but the farm pond, when it's aligned with this one, we should not finance it. Which, uh, that, that is a question mark I'm putting. We're not prescribing anything. That point, probably uh, experts would say, shall we, uh, for the interest of sustainability, looking at the five years ahead, of future ahead, shall we, uh, what kind of a clauses, regulatory clauses uh, should we put in this kind of a, uh, to avoid this kind of, to maintain the equilibrium, that's one thing. That I'm leaving it to the, uh, uh, it's a question mark. The third point is this, uh, uh, no, they, they, you know, we, we have to, uh, and, uh, and one more point, which is uh, very important for us, because we are also leading a climate change center over here. For us, it, uh, the uh, prima facie farm pond is an adaptation measure in Thailand areas. That too, farm pond is a time-tested, proven, well-tested, and with different kind of uh, models. But this model today uh, gave us a lesson, though if it is an case adaptation measure, prima facie, but it may lead to uh, mall adaptation during the life cycle of the project. This is also one uh, good lesson we learned. Uh, 
from this. Another one is uh, that, uh, no, look at the poor banker who is sitting in a Sangamner branch, an agriculture officer. His job is to push credit. How do you educate? How do you educate him? Uh, how do you uh, educate him? Look, this is a, the maximum you should do. Later on, you must stop it. It is easier said than done. What I, I, what I mean to say that we need to have a clear early warning signals saying that if you are looking at this without looking at the size part of it, groundwater part of it, dynamic water part of it, he said that if you happen to see that, suppose if water has not been filled up properly in the farm pond during the rain season, that's what you observe it, be cautious. Even if that kind of a caution, if you access it from Labat side, even that kind of a sensation happens to the banker side, then he will uh, tend to be that, he will not go to finance it. So this, this is kind of a indicators have to be developed and probably local, uh, like uh, local I mean, baseline and a clear cut uh, uh, the uh, groundwater, I mean, groundwater mapping, extent of uh, how much we can exploit it further. This is the one thing which is required. A central groundwater report has already been doing it. In the case of semi critical data, there are many companies such as banks, they are not financing it. Probably that kind of a micro kind of a planning has come. Now, many tools have come up. We are also using the GS based tools in our watershed planning. Probably this would be the answer to the question to ration the, the finance part up to, the, to this kind of a in these areas. That's what uh, uh, we are uh, planning. It's very, uh, very good uh, insight. A lot of insights uh, is given to us. I'm sure that it requires a further discussions at the policy making level. How do you regulate it? One more measure which uh, I would like to suggest, which has not been discussed, it is based on my practical experience, which is happening with us, with all of us, on two aspects. One thing is that the first thing which I do when I go to Hyderabad. In the morning, I will get up at 4.30. The first thing I do is uh, switching the bore well. Then switching of the bore well. The concern, and I had a lot of fights with my tenants, not on the money side. My electricity bill is my indicator because that bill where really a lot of controversy arises when common pool, when you say groundwater is a common pool, if you look at your own personal experience with your tenants on the electricity water bill, when the, when the price of extraction when the real is the price, then people tend to uh, rationalize it, subsidize it. Of course, it requires a, a kind of higher policy discussion. Probably this also has to be factored in. I think I'm sure that uh, groundwater regulations would factor in uh, this kind of a pricing part also, maybe for direct or indirect or incentives, direct incentives or direct benefits to address this uh, uh, issue on a sustainable way, I think. And uh, aquaculture, I've been uh, personally hit I'm the person who has been it. If neighboring aquaculture, uh, neighboring farmers are do, uh, converting the rice uh, fields to aquaculture, uh, you are forced to convert it. Otherwise, you have to simply abandon it. This is the kind of externality which I've seen in your case studies, which has been presented around. Right? They are the realities, uh, realities of externalities. And uh, looking at the uh, benefit of uh, private benefit or a social benefit or your own financial ratio or economic cost. There are the big gaps which are there, which we need to address it. Thank you very much. I've been greatly benefited for this topic. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank, Thank you. you for your wonderful presentation and wonderful insight. Murthy, sir, you are absolutely right how to regulate and how to control it. I think your previous uh, 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 Mr. Sunil Kumar, I think he may be considered as the most powerful man in India for regulating groundwater, but even he has shown his helplessness in regulating the extraction of groundwater for irrigation, which consumes more than 90% of total extraction. That's so well. the, I think as you have told the, the regulation in uh, groundwater extraction for irrigation, particularly farm pond type extraction should be with do different doses of different medicine, uh, not yes. only direct um, yes. the hammering. Thank yes. you, sir, for your uh, uh, wonderful uh, talk giving a lot of insights into different aspects. Uh, now I will invite uh, 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 Professor Sanjay Srivastav. Uh, he is Vice Chancellor of uh, Manabrachana, uh, Manabrachana uh, University. He is a, uh, I also work now as a chair professor in that, in one of the water technology center in that 
uh, university professor uh, uh, sivastav is i will say he is uh, beside very very learned man he is a great great uh, communicator i think he is a person who can even uh, explain the even the string theory in a very very uh, uh, simple manner understandable to understandable to all with this few words i invite uh, uh, professor sanjay sivastav to uh, share his views a bit from out of the box and out of all our standard thinking uh, process of the technical and uh, scientific person professor sanjay sivastav please thank you so much uh, first and foremost i take this opportunity to extend my gratitude and sincere thanks to dr marcela de suja director of wtor center for resilience studies and dr our own dr dipankar sahaji who is the chair professor of center of advanced techno water technology and management at our university for inviting me and extending the opportunity to share my thoughts on this very important and pertinent issue esteemed panelist sunil kumar sahab murthy sahab i could see on screen more than 190 odd participants fellow presenters it was a sheer delight to listen to your views on the subject and i see the galaxy of experts from different areas to name a few i could gather experts from water livelihood community and environment and as dr dipankar sah has rightly said i am not an expert from the water area and yet at the same time being being a thinker user and a student of management let me take you little away from what all we have discussed and let me take you to the address of our honorable prime minister on 15th of august from from the prachir of lal kila and if i quote his few points and he said in the era of amrit kal as a citizen we have to take five vows and three vows appear to me very pertinent one the first one he said developed india the third one he said apni virasat par garv and lastly nagrikon ka kartavya and what i could gather from murthy sahab and the expert comments of from dr sunil kumar sahab and with all the panelists perhaps on the fifth point the responsibility and duties of citizen this is one of the area of concern and being a student and follower of lord of shri in shrimad bhagavad gita lord said that two things should not be touched by you all to us as a citizen be a mere user one he talked about water and second he talked about air and when it comes to water in chapter 7 of shrimad bhagavad gita verse 8 i quote he says raso aham apsu konte whatever taste and whatever you see in water i am personally physically present there in every drop of water and second quote i go to purushottam yog of shrimad bhagavad gita chapter 15 verse 8 again which says which says that shariram yat avapnoti yat chapi utkramante ishvara grihitva eva etani sanyati vayu gandhana asyat and he talked about the importance of air as we all know that agriculture is the center of india's economy and livelihood about more than 19% i would say our gdp is dependent on agriculture and allied activities but still about 40% of the india's agriculture land is irrigated and i wish to draw your attention on a very pertinent point which murthy sahab has also shared in a very subtle way and i am taking cue from clue from there and the role of pond or tank is an important source of irrigation since ages and 
as the citizen of the country we need to take a call that how much water we are extracting from the ground and i come back to this point in a while but if we look at the broader picture the concept of farm pond has emanated from the idea that the excess runoff from the surface during monsoon will be stored in the tank within the adjoining to the land and it is used primarily for agriculture now the stored water in the farm pond will support irrigation of the owner's farm land and when monsoon is not there they are the they are totally dependent on that our honorable prime minister nurtures a a big vision of doubling farmers income and if this dream has to become a reality and if we have to reach out to that vision uh where providing a short irrigation will have a big role and now it is the collective responsibility of each one of us to ensure that how farm pond is being pushed by the central and the state governments particularly in rain fed areas where assured irrigation by canal etc is not available government is also extending its all possible subsidy uh, for construction of farm pond but again we have to take a conscious call on this very pertinent issue if we look at the bigger scenario and we heard honorable uh, secretary from government of maharashtra talking about the importance and i have seen and reminded of the presentation done by many presenters in the area who talked about the importance and how researches are on and what kind of measures we are doing good number of farm ponds is come are coming in existing particularly in central and southern parts of india because northern part is already gifted with little more rain but such ponds supposed to store the rain water for irrig- irrigating crops however many many a cases where i i see that water is pumped from underground to fill up the tanks and murthy sahab also talked about this that all those who are mighty rich and those who have resources they try to extract as much water as they can and usually it is not meaningfully used and again as i said it is the responsibility of each and every citizen to ensure that we use water consciously i am reminded by uh, one of the legend tennis player from united states arthur ashe who once said that is start where you are use what you have do what you can and the time has come where all of us we have to think what we can and this is the this is the clarion call for each one of us uh if i if i look at broader picture again from academic point of view the researches civil societies are highlighting the issues on how the groundwater resources are being misused in the farm ponds particularly in critical low rainfall areas where this resource should primarily be reserved for drinking uses we are mixing and again we are not judicious and wise to use the groundwater as well as the pond water i wish that the further presentation and deliberations in this seminar will bring out a considered and consensus view on how the farm pond should be properly used so that the farmers get the benefit and at the same time precious groundwater resources should also not be misused there are numerous farm ponds in our country across its length and breadth the outcome of the seminar will also help the government to take suitable policy initiative and come out with a better strategy on farm pond keeping in view of the enhancement of the income of the farmer and very important point is equity of water between rich and poor farmers and protecting the environment if we are conscious 
judicious on this issue i am sure in times to come this developing country india will surely be a developed country in the amritkal at manorachna educational institution following the arthur ash line start where you are use what you have and do what you can in our own humble way under the dynamic enthusiastic energetic leadership of our chair professor dr dipankar saha and his team we are also trying to ensure that all the 10 villages which we have adopted the badkhal lake given to us we are trying to ensure that they all these ponds should come to life and it help the farmer of the vicinity as an educational institution if we are not helping the society in a big way then perhaps as an institution we have failed in our duties or we are failing in our duties once again i take this opportunity to com- compliment dr saha and the entire team and and dr marcela de suja ma'am de suja ji director of wtor and the entire leadership team mr joy who also gave a wonderful exhibition of his uh, wisdom and put many things into perspective it was a sheer pleasure listening to you sir and i take this opportunity on behalf of dr saha and his team to invite you all to our campus we are located in ncr region in faridabad and see our beautiful campus and we look forward to have you with us to take your blessings and guidance <coughs> from and sunil kumar sahab this is my open invitation to you to be our guest and see how manav rachna is contributing its humble way to the society thank you very much jai hind thank you sir thank you for a wonderful uh, speech and uh, uh it is now uh, assured that the farm pond issue and the i would say misuse of groundwater through uh, farm pond particularly in the uh, low rainfall uh, rain fed areas of india has touched the cord uh, uh, beyond the um, hydrogeology scientist and sociologist economist who are particularly working uh, on the subject so it is reaching to a wider audience and it's a very good sign uh, thank you uh, uh, professor sivastav again for your wonderful presentation and uh, now i will hand over to uh, again uh, dr uh, marcila i think there are uh, number of questions and number of very uh, say senior people and learned people they are there in the uh, in the uh, uh, they are watching and attending so it will be a uh, i don't uh, i think mr jo- dr joy will coordinate yeah. so it will be a yeah. task for you please yes, i know yes yeah yeah thanks uh, dr dipankar sah so we move to the next segment of the uh, session i know we are already about 30 minutes uh, behind schedule but i think probably we can make up and we can be short in our interventions and the discussion point though we are called it as an open discussion probably it's not going to be so open as an open discussion would mean is going to be a little bit of a regulated discussion uh, because i can see in the chat box as dr dibangas has said ki there's a very active conversation going on i mean there are a lot of interesting points being raised and also that have been responded to so i think we can pick it up something or the other and it will be all in our proceedings and recordings i think it will be there and um, i would also say that um, this is not the end of this conversation so i think i would say that marcel would agree with me that uh, this is a beginning of an interesting conversation so we should take it at that way so in the discussion session what you have done is that uh, uh, we have uh, uh, tried to capture two types of voices in the discussion one is uh, two people are going to speak from the communities uh, who are going to so we are trying to capture the community voice there and later we are also going to hear from uh two of the departments who are related to ground water that is from maharashtra and telangana so first i would like to invite uh, uh, nanda kali ji uh, she is a member of the village development committee and samyukta mahila samiti uh, maswandi village uh, in maharashtra so nanda ta ata tumcha vel ek 3 minute madhe tumhi please sanga na tumcha kay mannai ya sagla goshti cha badal 
नंदता एक कदाचित हिंदी क्या मराठी में बोलना रहे हिंदी असेल भौतिक आणि सगळ्या इफ एव्हरीबडी इज गोइंग टू बी अंडरस्टँडिंग हिंदी देन देर इज नो नीड ऑफ ट्रान्सलेशन अदरवाइज विल सी ए ब्रॉडली यु नो टू ट्रान्सलेट टू इंग्लिश वॉट शी से नंदता आवाज येते थोडस तुम्ही माईक पासून थोडस दूर ठेवलं तर जास्ती स्पष्ट होईल मला वाटत अच्छा ओके हिंदी में बोलो चलेगा मेरा परिचय करवाती हूँ मेरा नाम है नंदा हा कृष्ण का बसवंडी तालुका संगमनेर जिला अहमदनगर हमारे यहाँ जो पांडलो क्षेत्र का, का प्रोग्राम हो गया है तो उसमें पानी की जो पाता है वो बढ़ गई और उसके बाद जो हमारे यहाँ खेती में काम करने है में बहुत बड़ा पानी आ गया उसके बाद हमारे जो क्षेत्रीय थे उसी ने पानी निकल आई तो उसके बाद हमने आ, सब मिलजुल कर कहा कि पानी ज्यादा मत क्योंकि वह ड्रिप ऐसा पानी लेकर तुम खेती का काम करो तो हमारे यहाँ बोरवेल का भी बंदी है हमारे यहाँ सौ टक्के बोर बंदी है और यहाँ हमारे यहाँ जो बोर लेगा तो उसको भी दस हजार तक दंड भी है तो हमारे यहाँ कोई भी बोर बोरवेल लेते भी नहीं और हमारे जो यहाँ गांव में पानी की पात्र है आज तक बहुत बढ़ गई है अगले वर्ष तो हमारे यहाँ बारिश भी नहीं हो गई थी लेकिन उस दिन भी हमारे यहाँ पीने के लिए पानी बहुत अच्छा ही था और अगले वर्ष तो बहुत बारिश हो गई एक हजार एक पन्ना टका मिली यहाँ बारिश हो गई है तो जो पाका है तो ठिबक संचन है और जो जो प्रोग्राम हो गए वहाँ वो भी आज तक वहाँ चालू है खेती में ट्रिप है सिंचन है गांव में कोई जो बोरबंदी लेगा तो उसको भी दंड रखा है उसके बाद कोई बोरवेल की गाड़ी आज तक हमारे गांव में आई भी नहीं है और पानी कैसा रखना है तो उसका ख्याल कैसा रखना है तो आज तक हमारे जो ग्रामस्थ है महिला है सब खेती में बहुत अच्छी तरह से काम करते हैं पानी का जो काम करना है वो बहुत अच्छी तरह से काम करते हैं तो हमको पांडलो क्षेत्र के विकास मार्फत से बहुत अच्छा बहुत अच्छा सीखना मिला जो पानी का ख्याल कैसा रखना है पहले तो हम दो दो बर्तन लेकर माथे पर पानी लाते थे लेकिन आज हमारे सब घरों में सब महिलाओं के लिए घर में भी पानी आ गया है हमको बहुत आनंद होता है ये जो प्रोग्राम हो गया है बहुत अच्छा है तो यहाँ जो हमारी मनीषा रिसोजा है ये भी हमारा बहुत अच्छी तरह से ख्याल रखती है चाह जो हमारी आश्रम शाला है तो आश्रम शाला वाले भी बोर लेते थे लेकिन हम सब मिलकर उसको बोरवेल नहीं दिया हम बोले नहीं लेंगे ग्राम पंचायत की मार्फत से उनको हमने पानी दिया लेकिन आज तक हमारे गांव में कोई भी बोरवेल नहीं है ये कहने का मतलब बहुत अच्छा है इसलिए हमारे गांव में कहा भी देखो हम हमको सभी को जो आने वाले लोग है तो उसको भी पानी ही पानी देखना मिलता है जो आज हमारी सब महिलाओं की ग्रामस्थों की जो खेती है आज हरी हरी हो गई है तो हमको बहुत बहुत खुश होती है तो यहाँ हमारी जो महिला है खेती में बहुत अच्छी तरह से काम भी करती है पानी का ख्याल भी रखती है और हमारे यहाँ कोई बोरवेल भी नहीं है जो ताड़े बंद है जो पानी का वो भी बहुत अच्छी तरह से सब लोग रखते है और पानी देख भी अपने खेती में पीक लेते हैं तो और कोई जो तुम्हारा जो कोई सवाल हो तो जरूर पूछो मैं उस पर बोल सकती हूँ अच्छा धन्यवाद टाइप की सो इज दैट नीड टू बी ट्रांसलेट टू इंग्लिश और एवरीबडी इज अंडरस्टूड आई डोंट नो आई थिंक 
I'll yeah. just introduce Nanda is from the Maswandi village, which yeah. is in the rain shadow Sorry. and very close to the areas which have been studied, where we have studied it and where extensive farm ponds are being lifted. So Joy, yeah. I leave it to you to... Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. So what, thanks, uh, Marcelo. So what Nandatai said was that, um, you know, they had taken a watershed development and because of that, the water level had increased. So, but one of the very interesting institutional regulations they brought in was that there are no bore wells in the village. Uh, so even if somebody takes a bore well, then there's about 10,000 rupees uh, fine on that. So that's an important thing. And they also have a water budgeting thing. And they also plant their crops as per the water budget of that year. So one of the years that she said it was a drought year, but still they didn't have any problem for drinking water, etc. And they're taking care of the water. And uh, it is a green village now. And also they are very happy. And also she thanked profusely to WTR and Marcella, especially saying that for taking care of. So Dhaniwad Nandatai. Yeah. So then we move to the next speaker. Um, uh, that is uh, Bhagwat Gagare. And he's also a member of the village water management team. Uh, he's from Kumbarwadi village. So, Bhagwadai, to me, ah, yeah. Ah, uh, Was it going to Hey, I was it, Tata. My name is Bhagwad Gagre, and my name is Kumbarwadi. I'm from Angamnair, from Ahmednagar district. In our village, से 2002 तक जो इंडो जर्मन पंडलोट प्रोजेक्ट हुआ है उसके बाद 2011 में जल व्यवस्थापन का कार्यक्रम चालू और उस प्रक्रिया में हम फार्म पॉन्ड की जो किसान हैं उनके बारे में कुछ बोलना चाहते हैं जो जल व्यवस्थापन करने में जो फार्म पॉन्ड के मालिक है उसका जो सहभाग है वो तो ठीक से चलता है लेकिन वो क्या कर रहे हैं जैसे कि 60 70 मिलीमीटर mm बारिश गिरा है और खेती में बुआई करनी है उस टाइम पे वो अपना कुएं का जो पानी थोड़ा बहुत आता है वो फार्म पॉन्ड में भर देते हैं और उस टाइम पे ग्राउंड वाटर है वो निकालकर फार्म पॉन्ड में रिजर्व करके रखते हैं उसमें जो जिनके पास फार्म पॉन्ड नहीं है उनके लिए पानी मिलता नहीं है उनके फसल के लिए भी पानी मिलता नहीं है ऐसा जब कम बारिश गिरता है तब हो जाता है और उसमें जो पानी है फार्म पॉन्ड वो ड्रिप सिंचन या स्प्रिंकलर इरिगेशन करके वो इस्तेमाल कर रहे हैं लेकिन उसमें अभी कम किसान है फार्म पॉन्ड वाले इसलिए वो थोड़ा वो चल रहा है बाद में जो इस प्रक्रिया चल रही है जैसे कि पानी व्यवस्था पर उसमें बाद में ज्यादा फार्म पॉन्ड बन जाएंगे गांव में तो बहुत बड़ी परेशानी आ सकती है जैसे कि फार्म पॉन्ड का पानी है वो एक किसान का है अगर उस मालिक बन गए है वो पानी उन्होंने ग्राउंड का जो पानी है सब निकलकर फार्म पॉन्ड में रखा है इसलिए वो मालिक बन गया है अगर वो जो पानी है ग्राउंड में रह गया तो वो पानी सबको मिल सकता है ऐसा आ, उसकी उस फार्म पॉन्ड की वजह से परेशानी आ सकती है हमारे गांव में भी अभी सत्रह अठारह में तो पूरे महाराष्ट्र में ड्राउट ही गिर गया था तो उस टाइम पे आ, हमने वाटर बजेटिंग करके पांच करोड़ लीटर पानी बचकर रखा था जो पीने के लिए आ, काम आ सकता है पूरा क्रॉप क्रॉप प्लानिंग करके बचकर रखा था उस साल जो छह किसानों ने अपने फार्म पॉन्ड नए बनाए अपने प्लास्टिक सीट डालकर वो दो दो चार चार इलेक्ट्रिक पंप बिठाकर उन्होंने आ, सब ग्राउंड वाटर निकाल कर उसमें स्टोर कर दिया तो उस टाइम पे हमें ऐसा लगा कि वो जनवरी में उन्होंने पानी निकाल कर फार्म पॉन्ड में रखा था और हमारे गांव में पीने के लिए अप्रैल में पानी पीने के लिए बचा ही नहीं तो हमने पता कर लिया कि पानी कहाँ गया हमारा 
जो वाटर बजटिंग करके हमने पानी सेव कर लिया था पांच करोड़ लीटर वो पानी कहा गया तो सर्वे करके पता चला कि पानी था पानी है लेकिन वो खुद मालिक बन गए वो सब के साथ जिनके पास फॉर्म पॉट है वो मालिक बन गए तब उस साल गांव में टैंकर बोलाने की जरूरत पड़ी ऐसी परेशानी है अगर ज्यादा फॉर्म पॉन बन गए वो फॉर्म पॉन से वाइब्रेशन बहुत हो जाता है पानी स्टोर करके रखा तो उस पानी में ऑक्सीजन की कमी हो जाती है फसल के लिए भी वो अच्छा नहीं रहता है दूसरा एक फसल उगाने में ज्यादा खर्चा भी आ जाता है ऐसा ऐसा सब कुछ चल रहा है हमारे गांव में अगर इसके फार्म फॉर्म के ऊपर अगर कुछ नहीं हुआ जैसे कि हम अभी बोरवेल के लिए बंदी लगा रहे हैं वैसे ज्यादा फार्म फॉर्म बन गए तो उसके लिए भी बयान करना पड़ेगा ऐसा कुछ तो हमारे गांव में चल रहा है बहुत तो उसकी आगे अगले भविष्य में उसकी परेशानी हो सकती है अभी भी हमारे यहाँ उसकी परेशानी चल रही है ऐसे जैसे कि जो सार्वजनिक पानी है वो कंपाउंड में रिजर्व कर कर रखते हैं तो उस, पा, उस पानी पर सार्वजनिक हक बदल जाता है हर एक किसी एक किसान का या दो किसान का हक को उस पर हो जाता है इसलिए उसकी बहुत परेशानी थैंक यू धन्यवाद हाँ धन्यवाद भगवत जी आई थिंक so he raised very important issues related to the topic we are discussing i mean he also gave a background the village they are taken up into you know watershed development program the indo german uh, watershed program and things and uh, uh, they also have a few uh, farm ponds and since the number is less there the issues are not so visible the negative impacts and things but he has taken a very clear stand saying that the groundwater should remain within the ground and not put it in the uh, farm ponds and things if the numbers are going to increase then not more people are going to be deprived of uh, water and there are going to be whole lot of issues in fact he also told about the villages on initiative in, in the last drought how they prepared a water budgeting and they could save something like about 5 crore a liter of water which they could make use for drinking water and things but the last point he mentioned i think is very important for today's discussion which i also wanted to raise it sometime saying that ground water which is supposed to be a sarvajanik that is a public resource or a common pool resource we say and by pumping that putting it into the farm ponds we are privatizing that resource i think there important thing which is brought in is the whole question of property regime changes through this type of technologies and things which are bringing in and this is something which we need to be aware of so both both dhanyawad uh, bhagwan ji for uh, the uh, issues up uthaya uske liye now we shift to the next two uh, brief very brief Uh, interventions by uh, to in a way i would say regulating bodies in uh, maharashtra and telangana so from telangana we have uh, shri pandit uh, madnure who is the director uh, of the groundwater department of government of telangana he will be sharing his insights sir i would request to be uh, you know you to be little brief you know we are running out of time so about 3 to 4 minutes sir yeah thank you yeah thank you sir uh... thank you madam uh, marcela uh, respected dipankar sah sir uh, chairman central ground water board dr sunil kumar sir and other dignitaries who are there <coughs> yeah you rightly said sir uh, so without going into the details of this uh, deliberations on the farm town farm ponds i think a lot of discussions have been taken place on this farm ponds i am not going into the merits as well as the day merits of this farm ponds but uh, i wanted to highlight some of the things uh, which the government of telangana has taken into uh, uh, more uh, interventions in the more most in the supply side interventions in the water sector as you know very well that telangana is the recently formed state and uh, it has achieved many laurels under the honorable chief ministership of our uh, chief minister uh, sri k chandrashekar rao garu so in water sector after the formation of telangana state in the year 2015 so the main program has been taken uh, that is the mission kaktya uh, which is uh, widely appreciated all over the world and the particularly the uh, the niti ayog uh, it has appreciated it has been appreciated and this program a flagship program uh, was taken up uh, in the year 2015 with a tagline our village our tank the main purpose was uh, for restoration of these tanks uh, on a massive scale uh 
the main reason for this uh, program was to carry the on the legacy of the kaktia dynasty actually these tanks were developed uh, in the year in the kaktia dynasty and it has been uh, taken over by the different dynasties then they have maintained that thing and uh, under this tax almost in the more there there are more than 46500 uh, minor irrigation tax in the state and out of those 46500 almost 20000 27000 tanks have been restored by the government of telangana in the phase wise manner that is in the four phases they have taken up the uh, program and uh, more than 27000 tanks have been restored and as a result of that thing lot of improvement is there uh, with respect of your uh, groundwater table as well as uh, the livelihood improvement in the uh, farmers community as the income has been grown up as well as the uh, the tank birds which were earlier in the depleted conditions they have been restored properly now there is plenty of water is available and uh, there could be uh, this uh, they have almost uh, 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 they have restored the tank i cut to more than 8 8 lakh uh, acres so these are the some of the things uh, which the government has taken apart from this uh, my irrigation tanks and uh, almost uh, they have uh, invested about 3800 crores in this uh, uh, restoration of tanks and uh, almost 800 crores uh, of siltation it means the farmers might have saved about 800 crores uh, in the form of siltation because this siltation whatever the silt they have removed from the tanks it has been supplied freely to the farmers and they have taken the uh, uh, silt to their farms and uh, as a result uh, they have the reduce uh, the dependency on the fertilizers so almost they have become the organic farmers for this particular period two three years period so so it has helped a lot and uh, uh, as i have said that in the last seven years ha the water table in the telangana state has been risen ah. by more than 4.26 meters as compared to uh, 2015 pre monsoon season in the year 2022 the water table has been risen by more than 4.26 meter which is equivalent to about 400 tmc in the entire state so these are the some of the things uh, apart from uh, irrigation tanks the other programs have also been taken up that is you are uh, uh, a lot of uh, uh, this uh, 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 surface water uh, irrigation structures they have been uh, re, re, re reinvestigated and like your kaleshwaram lift irrigation projects as well as the different types of project different projects we have taken up and uh, the government is filling the water tanks what what this uh, small irrigation tanks also they are filling up at the regular intervals more than 10000 tanks are being filled at the regular intervals and there is perennial uh, uh, water available in those tanks and uh, it is helping to recharge the aquifer so as a result as i already told that more than 4.26 meter rise is there in the uh, pre monsoon season and uh, as compared to 2017 resource estimation the groundwater extraction has been reduced by more than 29% in the state of telangana so now it is the 42% whereas the before uh, 2017 uh, as per uc 2017 it was 65% so almost that much of uh, reduction is there in the stage of extraction uh, we have taken a plot of uh, catch the rain campaign also the, under the jal shakti abhiyan program implemented by the government of india we are creating lot of awareness program also it is helping now you know very well the telangana is one of the rice bowl of india after punjab i think we are the largest producer of rice these are the some of the things which the government of telangana has achieved in the last 7 years of uh, after its formation so just i wanted to highlight that things so the definitely the mission kaktya has helped uh, uh, a lot uh, in improving the water table these are the some of the things sir uh, joy sir yeah. i did that uh, from my side if you are okay. yeah. very uh, i am there sir thank you yeah thanks uh, pandit garu and uh, thanks and i think probably uh, you know sometime you like to come visit and see what is the mission kaktya is doing and thank it you, is sir. Yeah, yeah. what you said yeah, about welcome, the sir, water, uh, definitely yeah, the other yeah, members yeah. yeah. welcome yeah. heard so much about that yeah Yeah. Now we shift to uh, Maharashtra. So we have Sri C. Joshi, uh, who is the Director, Groundwater Surveys and Development Agency, that is the GSDA of Government of Maharashtra. Sri Joshi Sir. Um, is he there? Anybody can locate him? Yeah, I think he's here down, but I'm not sure whether he's online. 
Oh, okay. Do we have his number or something? We just want to I'll, call I'll him. I'll just call him. I'll just yeah, call him. Yeah. Meanwhile, yeah. you can take a question or just... Yeah, yeah. So, um, friends, um, I know we have a little... Uh, I mean, doing not so great about the timing, but I think probably we can extend by about 5-10 minutes. So, that will give us a couple of, uh, you know, two, three questions we can take up. So, maybe before see Joshi joins, if anybody has any burning issues to be raised, any... Uh, anything to say about way forward, especially in terms of, uh, you know, this whole uh, around farm pond, uh, what could be. So please put up your hand and uh, we can uh, start this discussion. So any first takers? Yes, yeah, sir. Uh, from my side, I just I wanted to raise one question, sir. Yeah, sir, as, as uh, Murthy, sir, from the Nabad, he has rightly pointed out as well yeah. as our uh, chairman, sir, uh, honorable chairman, sir, as well as the, uh, the Dipankar sir, sir, also told that yeah. there, there should be some regulation and the most of the farmers from the Tela, uh, that Maharashtra, they have also said that sir, correct, there should be yeah. some regulation on the uh, construction of these farm ponds. Mm -hmm. I, one way we are uh, recharging, we are spending a lot of money for, uh, for recharging the aquifer and mm -hmm. another way we are extracting the same mm -hmm. water from the aquifer and we are just uh, uh, the almost as uh, 25 to 30 percent of the water which is available in the pump ponds. Yeah. It as a evapotranspiration mm -hmm. and if you see the infiltration through this recharge, it is almost uh, equal. So it means you are not doing anything, you just you are evaporating the whatever the money you are spending right. on those pump yes. ponds, just you are evaporating. So my That's right. that, uh, uh, whenever we want to take up such type of farm ponds, there should not, uh, it means the OCS areas, more particularly the OCS, that is over-exploited, critical, semi-critical yeah. areas. In those such areas, there should not be any funding for the from the yeah. government side so that uh, the uh, it should be uh, discouraged to take up the farm ponds in those such areas. More yes. In safe yeah, areas, that's an in safe areas, no doubt, the, as the Secretary of uh, uh, Agriculture has said that uh, definitely if the uh, water is available in that area, you can pump the water from the downside and you can take it to the upstream side. Yeah. There is no harm. But uh, in the OCS area, I think there should be some regulation. Yeah, Thank yeah. you. You are absolutely right. I think that is the spirit, I think, coming from many of the speakers here. And I think even the initial speakers like Shashi Shagarji and WG also mentioned that uh, probably there should be a lot of regulation, especially in terms of putting uh, you know, borewell water uh, into farm ponds and things, and also especially over exploited zones and things we need to. So I think one of the ideas for this discussion is that what are the type of regulatory mechanisms? And these regulatory mechanisms cannot be only top down. And I think somebody also mentioned that how does community is going to be involved in these type of regulations? And there are also, I mean, the community voice will be heard. There have been, they are also putting in certain uh, rules and norms uh, in terms of, you know, how to regulate uh, groundwater use and things. But absolutely, you're right. Uh, this is a very important issue. How do we, when we promote such things, what are the type of regulatory or non-negotiables which you need to go with such type of programs and things? Yeah, thanks. Uh, is uh, Joshi Saab there or uh, no? No, he's he had to get he's, into another meeting just okay, now. Okay, that's fine. So we, got so a we have, late, yeah, yeah. So we have oh. some time for some more discussions. We can spend maybe about 10 minutes for discussion. So anybody has any other issues to be raised, please. Yeah, go ahead. So three participants raised their hands. I can't see them. Who can we just speak up one by one? All the three. Uh, let me see who are the people who are raised. No. I, I think one was. Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, no. Uh, one is Vandana Patekar, I can see. Yeah. Vandana Thai. Vandana Ji, please go ahead. Can you hear me? Her hand is up. Well, other people, anybody can tell me? I think earlier, yeah, one Mahindra. Then there is a Mahindra Mehta who has raised his hand. Hello. Yes, can you hear yeah. me? Yeah, yeah, please go ahead. <laughs> please be brief, sir. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm very brief. I have no question. I just want to give a suggestion. There should be please. operation suppression also uh -huh. from the farm, farm pounds because if the farm pounds are big, a lot of water is evaporates. Mm -hmm. So we should adopt evaporation method. Aquaguard is one of the things which, by which we can do, though it is expensive little, but we can try in Australia, it is being done and we should try with this. Okay. 
Uh, okay, thanks for the if suggestion. If somebody wants to details, I can give the details. Okay, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sir, 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 just, just, just one minute. I say since Mahendra Mehta Sahib has intervened, yeah. just one, one or two words about him. He was, uh, he was, and he still he is the one of the best mind in groundwater in India. I would say he was okay commissioner in the ministry. Uh, oh. looking after the groundwater issues in the entire water resource ministry. Thanks, thanks Mr. for sparing your time and yeah. giving your thanks, time. Thanks, thanks, thanks a lot. Yeah. Uh, I, will just, it... just, I will just add one more thing, if you permit. Yeah, please, be quick. Yeah. In, a 2000, in a 2004, we started the, this work of farm funding by giving Government of India, Ministry of Water Resources, giving their fund to NABAR. Mm -hmm. So this is right from 2004, it is going on. That's true for, for information. Okay, thanks, thanks. We have Suresh Kulkarni ji, whose hand is up. Is Suresh ji there? Suresh? Oh. Or if he's not there, then we have Chandra Varshne. Yeah, please unmute and speak, yeah. Uh, Th thank you for the opportunity. Yeah. Uh, just I will take uh, half a minute. Yeah, please. I think uh, this the issue of farm pond has been discussed in the state of Maharashtra since years. And unfortunately, there is no policy mm -hmm. regarding the regulation of this. Let me say a very uh, in a crude way, it is a grabbing of groundwater actually by rich person, rich farmers, or what, what is, whatsoever you call it. So there is a groundwater word, uh, act supposed to be implemented in the state of Maharashtra. Mm -hmm. And it is still there on the desk of the MWRI in the, in the department of this, uh, this uh, water supply and sanitation from last eight years. Mm -hmm. Why? Because all this issue comes, we talk a lot about the community participation, etc., etc. But until and unless we have some policy for regulations, all this community participation will not be effective. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Measures in what was happening in Andhra Pradesh, it was a big project by World Bank, and what yeah. is going on is today. Okay. Uh, it is a very challenging, and unfortunately, groundwater is nobody's baby. Mm. Water Resource Department talks only about the canal water. And groundwater or GSDA, water supply sanitation department, they are only bothered about the water supply for domestic purposes. Mm -hmm. And irrigation is most neglected, I think, a part in India as such. Although we talk that 80%, 90% is taken. So ultimately, at the end of the you know our discussion, are the government or the professionals are uh, they can they put up to the farmer they, uh, the, the, that the, the policy makers that this groundwater we, we know everybody who has seen in Maharashtra that groundwater constructing farm pond above the surface how it is going to be a farm pond it is not yeah. okay. we know we are seeing this but nobody is trying to build the cat so out of, yeah. this, out of this are we going to make any policy changes in the ground in the farm pond construction that is mm -hmm. my question there is a lot okay. to discuss but first is groundwater authorities should be made active and they are the really the authority who can regulate this uh, grabbing of groundwater mm -hmm. thank you yeah thanks uh, suresh it's an important issue i think maharashtra example you said though we passed the act i think so many years back still we have not been able to even finalize the rules related to the act and things. I think Absolutely. the draft was regulated. I don't think it has been approved and things yet. So it's an important issue where uh, these type of regulatory systems have to be put in place. And uh, this has to be really an important question, which even not only the government, but I think the civil society organizers also has to be, you know, participate in this and also try to put some pressure saying that we need to have some regulatory systems and things. So we have Vandana Patekar's hand. Is she there? Or, uh, 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 go to Chandra. Then we'll Vashne. go to Chandra. Yeah, Chandra Vashne. Yeah. Hello, can you hear me? Hello. Yes, yes. Please go ahead. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Yeah. yeah. 
I think uh, regulation for this farm pond, to my mind, is essential <laughs> because uh, effort should be made that we should really collect the rainwater to be stored in the farm pounds mm -hmm. rather than to mine the water from the underground aquifer. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that we have to state in any regulation that is going to come should really spell out this thing very clearly. This is number okay. one. Okay. The second yeah. point that I want to make is that the watershed management means that it is not the underground water which need to be pumped. It <laughs> yeah. is only the watershed which needs to be managed to collect the water. Yeah. It is here that the hydrological structures have to be so created that mm. the low-lying areas collect this water for the use of the community. Mm. And the last point that I want to make it that these water ponds should be made more productive. Mm. The sense that uh, fisheries and other... Yeah. Aquatic resources must be added and mm. should be encouraged to really promote the yeah. income of the farmers. And then the interest of the community will come because many fisheries people will come who may not have any access to the land, but will be having mm. some kind of a livelihood, a livelihood. Out the for the nine months or six months for which they hold water. Yeah, and yeah. the final point that I want to make is that under drought conditions, even though the ponds may not have water, but certainly they have enough soil moisture for subsequent mm -hmm. cropping mm -hmm. season. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's an interesting concept that uh, farm ponds as a multi use uh, systems type of a thing. We need to think about that. This interesting thing. So I think we'll have the last intervention in the discussion session now. Uh, that, that I can see Samarendra, Samarendra Sahu, who is there? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, is Samarendra there? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, yeah. Just be quick. Yeah. 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 So actually, the one because there are two scenario. One is farm pond, and another is groundwater. So if we considering the farm pond and groundwater, so most of the groundwater is utilized by in, in case of agriculture not not only the farm pond it's for the to irrigating the crops so if we considering the farm pond hardly one or two percent farmers only utilize the groundwater as a source of farm pond water most i think more than 90 percent of the groundwater utilized for the agricultural purpose so we should uh, uh, do some policy Mm -hmm. to utilizing the groundwater through government because like some government has insisting to our farmers free of electricity so they are running the bore wells or any other source of water <coughs> as much as possible so th that is the most wastage of water of groundwater so i don't think uh, farm pot is only the source of uh, wasting of water as a groundwater so that's okay. my point yeah. thank you thanks samrendra so i think we will uh, wind up this particular segment of the you uh, know this whole discussion we had so thank you very much for the active participation all those who spoke and uh, participate in that now i'll hand it over to marcela for the last the concluding session the going forward i think that's the last uh, i mean last not the least very important session Trying to say what are the type of takeaways we have from this. So over to Marcela. Yes, um, I would like to thank everyone for this very, very enriching discussion. And uh, since we have recorded it, um, uh, I would like to say that it is not uh, going to conclude with this session. Mm -hmm. I know there are a lot of hands put up, some many couldn't ask, but just to what I picked up the three key messages I want to say before I hand it over to Dr. Venkateshwar Lu, that uh, groundwater needs to be considered as a common property resource. This came up right from the time when Mr. Shashi Shekhar spoke, even to the farmers who mentioned it. They said, yeah. we need to look at groundwater as a common property resource. We need to look at this, uh, at water and its use not just for uh, the benefit of some, that is with the farmer, the, the, those who can extract, but also the equity issue needs to be addressed. Equity, when it comes to the large farmers, the small and marginal farmers, for those who need for drinking, 
and also an issue about equity for nature, which we may have forgotten. Mm. But we need to consider it because that's all a part of our ecosystem. You know, and we need to look at water very, very seriously, the groundwater. Uh, this, uh, you know, highlighting this, I think as uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Sanjay Srivastava mentioned very nicely, we need to look at it as citizens. We as citizens, although we are here coming in as scientists and those working with the development sector, et cetera, we don't need to look at those people having to look at it, but we as citizens need to take responsibility and put that in our sphere. I think also Mr. <clears throat> uh, Burti put it very nicely. He put in the rules and regulations that need to be put in place. And he spoke it very well from the banking sector because in the banking sector, very quickly, they raised the flags, they put up issues and, and um, you know, immediately action is being taken. And these sort of regulations need to be put in place. This came up, the regulations came up from many of the speakers, including Mr. Sunil Kumar, who talked about how we can make good use of it regarding the quality and water but the farm ponds is just not that for the dry land areas, but also for the coastal areas. And then hearing the speakers from the villages was very encouraging because they were showing us the light of how we need to go forward. If these villages can look at putting groundwater as, you know, regulating it, uh, reducing it so that it is kept more underground, those voices guide us as to how we need to go forward. So I put this just in a nutshell because the time is limited. You know, and uh, I would now like to, I would like to thank every speaker for, you know, the very intensive discussions and we will document and share it. But before, um, as a part of the concluding session, I would like Dr. Venkateshwar Lu to give us the, uh, a summary of how we can go forward. I think we all know Dr. Venkateshwarlu very well. He is very well known in the agriculture uh, uh, you, uh, sector here in the ICR in, in India and uh, has been the vice chancellor of the Parbani University. And he has been ranked as one of the uh, 30 top ranking uh, scientists in India uh, from the agronomy and plant science sector. And he's mm -hmm. working very intensively in the rural sector. So Dr. Venkateshwarlu is the very right person who can give us uh, uh, you know, uh, guidance on how we can go forward. Dr. Venkateshwarlu, I hand it to you. Uh, thank Please you, Marcella. Yeah. Am, I, am I audible, uh, Marcella? Yes. Am I audible? Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. first of all, uh, thank you very much for this uh, wonderful opportunity and uh, I have been uh, listening in the last two hours, you know, uh, excellent uh, presentations and viewpoints from all. First of all, I would like to, you know, thank you your amazing ability of water to always find talent, you know. I saw your young people today, you know, presenting uh, very good research uh, from the groundwater, hydrology, and especially Pooja is a prize catch, you know, really the way uh, she did the modeling work on, uh, mm. you know, the whole concept uh, I think it's really, uh, I think re she really deserves appreciation. Of course, whether we can apply it or not, but uh, it's wonderful work. Uh, I, I wanted to say before I say anything on this. Uh, the first and foremost is there have been a lot of questions in the chat box about uh, that we wrongly calling as. Uh, so there is no doubt at all that what we are actually talking today is not a farm pond because farm pond, uh, even 1960s, 70s, 80s, 90s, we had this as a part of the watershed program. So in the watershed program, one of the uh, one of the components is, of course, uh, in-situ water conservation. And second component is harvesting surplus runoff and storing in a dugout pond. This is there in 1980 onwards. It's not something new. So only problem is down the line in the 2000 after with the entry of uh, high-tech horticulture and high-value crops, export orientation and all, then this whole farm pond got into a misnomer. And uh, especially in one or two watersheds you know, where they 
uh, harvested uh, rainwater and then slowly they started uh, recharging groundwater uh, bore well uh, and then entering and in, in, uh, introducing horticulture like grapes and banana etc then the whole thing got into a wrong direction and unfortunately maharashtra the subject has been so sensitive when i was a vice chancellor also i used to attend many meetings in the secretariat and there used to be always the pressure from all the mlas from all the you know corporators to the ministers sir hamare gaon mein shet tal abhi aapne panch hi diya aap 10 dijiye 10 sanction karo to so, shet tal was a you know kind of uh, favor the minister uh, does to a village community <coughs> although we saw today some sane voice from some of the ahmednagar villagers <coughs> where the water is working but by and large in the state as a whole there is a mad demand for the so called shetal which is basically a dug out pond dug with the little money from the uh, farmer but more from the government in fact although the table shows they are getting only 10% from the government and 90% they are uh, putting themselves i think that is wrong there are many cases where the government uh, gives uh, large sums of money for the shetal that's why it is a such a huge uh, you know demanded kind of favor and uh, those of you who travel from delhi to pune uh, from the aircraft when the aircraft is lowering down you will see so many in the rainy season so many water bodies you know these are all actually so called shetals or the farm ponds which are dug out mostly above the uh, ground so this is one i think uh, so all the all of those people who raised the questions uh, let us settle this issue that we are now talking about the so called storage structures not the farm ponds as we know in in the traditional term where we simply harvest and those farm ponds which we generally know are not more than 500 cubic meter they are very small because there every individual farmer try to harvest in his own land you know not more than 2 3 hectares and that will not be more than 500 cubic meters but here we are talking about 20000 10000 you know that kind of figure so obviously it's a reservoir rather than a pond that's number 1 number 2 is that uh, i you know secretary mr dawle i don't know whether he is still there he himself said and earlier secretaries also they keep on saying that this shetal program is very successful in maharashtra and as a result we were able to increase horticulture and our income of farmers has gone up it's not that first time water is raised in issue some 6 7 years ago myself and crispin we were sitting in the secretariat with the mini, with mr earlier chief minister devendra fadnavis and there was a discussion when the pokra was being formulated and that time itself we raised this voice but somehow you know the the lobby is so strong that uh, the the rich farmers voice is always heard and the farmer who loses who doesn't have a wherewithal to go for a bore well his voice is off, not often heard so therefore it is a very sensitive and challenging issue of equity it's not that simple as we just hold one brainstorming and take a proceedings and the minister will agree as joy said for 10 years they have been discussing on the policy and mm. this is the same story in all other states in every state andhra has come out with the water and land act walta but you know down the line they had not at all able to uh, succeed in implementation and as far as i know in india when a land is registered it is written that i am handing over this land with all the treasures in mm. underground including water except gold because mm. gold only belongs to the government so therefore in our registration system itself there is a wrong concept that you know the water belongs to the person who owns the land so now i think we have to tackle at that point you know not not just saying that uh, it's a community resource is saying is okay but then legally you know they have a right that, that's the whole issue that settles in two three states where i am familiar i don't know all over india what is the language of land registration and the rights of uh, purchasers uh, rights this is one thing second thing is uh, marcela said this is not just a problem of maharashtra it's a problem of entire country but marcela the the magnitude is very serious in maharashtra i tell you even in gujarat this is not so uh, yeah. so rampant in andhra yes. it is very rampant in rail seema region karnataka yes. to some extent but even in gujarat madhya pradesh uttar pradesh it is not at all rampant and 
in eastern states like jharkhand chatisgarh odisha there also we have but they are called dabris or they are called ofrs mm. on farm reservoirs mm. where yeah. they 100% store only rain water only for a supplemental irrigation during during kharif crop and sometimes for a rabi vegetables but they never mm. use for pumping ground water so therefore mm. your focus on maharashtra is fully out to have maharashtra as the focal point and this okay. is where we have to change the policy or mindset of the rulers whatever it is and uh, but one setback for us in our campaign is that in the last 3 4 years we have been receiving very heavy rainfall in the central india and mm-hmm. uh, as a result you know farmers uh, have forgotten about uh, water shortage drought drinking water issues fodder issues 2017 18 was the last uh, year that hit us very badly mm-hmm. after that by and large you know we are having and even future projections also say the climate change projections that central india will have more extreme rainfall events and more uh, <coughs> wet seasons and all so therefore this is another you know challenge of a climate change whether what will happen in future is some sort of uncertainty in there second is uh, about the evaporation control many uh, speakers have asked and uh, actually there are two three options already tried in india one is the thermocol sheets uh, spreading on the surface but unfortunately when the wind blows they are all go to one corner so they fail then we have tried cetyl alcohol which is globally uh, sprayed on the surface it will stay at least for 2 3 weeks you know so every 2 3 weeks you have to but then if you want to do fisheries then that is not recommended and we just now heard uh, somebody is talking about aqua guard in australia i think marcela you should contact him and find out what it is yes. it is a chemical or it is a physical layer or it is a yeah. whatever it is and if it is worth trying i think that is one uh, one contribution we can make to at least uh, minimize yes. the loss of water into the atmosphere and uh, another small intervention one adilabad farmer made in andhra some 10 years ago when we were doing this program of course that was a small farm pond of 500 cubic meters he simply erected a trellis with a bamboo uh, from both the sides and uh, meeting it in the central and then he uh, planted so many creepers vegetables you know so he was actually protecting the evaporation and also making some money out of the uh, pond at least for 2 3 months you know and he was able to do fishery also so i think uh, you must uh, uh, open a throw open a challenge to come out with some out of box ideas which are not very cost intensive which will really help us to uh, stop the evaporation from farm pond that is definitely one thing another thing we can do in the interim is that while they are recharging from bore well water but let them also recharge the bore well itself you know that there are some structures you know where the bore well recharging is done that that can be made mandatory at least immediately you know, without much uh, uh, effort you know that can be made and uh, finally i think uh, the uh, the the point is that uh, while it can uh, the the whole uh, thing change of mindset can start from the community community can put pressure on the government to come out with a new act or an amendment of the existing act but certainly it is going to take time but in the meanwhile puja's alternative of you know that uh, kharif rabi hangama and uh, planning the crop season based on the you know water available in the previous uh, kharif season i think that really appeal to me uh, if she can take it to the government during kharif hangama she can make a presentation rabi hangama and uh, at least you know some beginning can be made uh, uh, to to use the water rationally some sort of crop budgeting some sort of crop planning water budgeting at the village level i think that uh, you say 100 villages become successful by water budgeting then the government will be forced to think on this you know now because we have a scattered examples one water example one here and there you know anna hazare but then i think if it can become a mass uh, uh, big uh, movement and many many villages keep on going in this route that uh, we can budget our water in our village we can avoid digging bore wells we can still get good profitable crops we can still get enough drinking water for a village if that can be proved in across say four or five districts across say 100 villages i think then the government will be forced to listen to us sit with us and then they will definitely do whatever that is required either in terms of legal or technical or financial interventions so i think uh, with these remarks uh, i would once again 
uh, you know congratulate you for this uh, wonderful uh, and intellectual sort of discussion this is a very sensitive you require a lot of courage you know to uh, undertake this kind of discussions which generally go against the you know uh, general perception of the people because generally the government thinks it is a good scheme and we are helping our farmers but reality we saw your young people presenting so nicely that uh, at least after 3 uh, 4 uh, years it is going to hit everybody including the farmers who have the ground water so with these remarks uh, thank uh, you for this opportunity and also to to everybody for their excellent presentations thank you very much once again uh, thank you dr venkateshwar ru for summing up and for coming out with some ideas uh, that we definitely need to take forward as you said we cannot let it we cannot be quiet with this having the, brought up this topic now at the national level and i agree with you also we need to begin in the in the state where it is most needed and many other states needed to but we begin here in maharashtra just before i hand it over to uh, my colleague uh, ankita to say the vote of thanks i have a couple of points uh, thoughts that we've had about how we take this forward i have to admit that uh, when we came about with this discussion and uh, even dr dipankar sahab would agree when we came about with this discussion we knew that at this time we had to raise the issue and bring in very uh, uh, eminent speakers to come together on one platform so uh, here i would have to say a big thank you for all of you for participating dr sahab for being able to bring this um, very eminent and important persons into it however having said this i do not think that this can be whether or we will all agree that this can be the end of the discussion or rather i would say this is only a beginning and as i think of the topic i can see three pathways that we need to look at it on one pathway is we need we cannot put india all into one scientific type where you have the same type of geology and hydrology and agriculture and climate we have a different agro ecological zones we have the different geological zones we need to have the scientific uh, community from the different perspectives come together to identify what we need to do where where farm ponds are appropriate what are the type of farm ponds where are they appropriate or what are the water sources that we need to do this has to be in a very sound scientific way and that is one stream from my little knowledge in that area i think of the other aspect we came about in the discussions here is how do we take it forward with the policy level that to needs bringing out all these discussions and gathering together the different discussions that we have Uh, had over the years and different groups that have had the discussions to come about how do we actually get into the policy make take good policy decisions and implement them one of the uh, one of the inputs we picked up was a lack of the follow up the monitoring systems we need to put all this in place <clears throat> because finally if we do not have water our country cannot go forward but and so this is with another group of people what we need to work together with it and the third sector that came out very well and we had it coming up from the community was you know taking it to the ground we have a large um, group of civil society organizations practitioners communities who can contribute these so that is another stream in which we need to take it forward in this respect i would like to share Uh, some of the activities that we have been doing with water in what WOTR over the years, since the past at least since the past seven years, we have been working on water stewardship, and uh, the two uh, villagers described about how they are managing the water. You know, a water stewardship that comes about with the community coming together to recharge, looking at the demand and supply, supply and demand side, and managing the water. in the years of drought and in the years of good rainfall so they look at the measurement they plan the uh, kharif season the rabi crops 
as each of these according to the water that is available in that village. So Pooja, to supplement what you were saying, here we've got another method of the whole uh, ground, the uh, water stewardship approach. And very recently, we have published the document on how to do it. I think we have implemented it in over 260 villages over the years. And we've got this experience tested out. And then the groundwater governance standard. We need to implement this also. We are coming out with a book shortly on how do we implement the groundwater governance standard, which is by the local community. I think this is what Mr. Shashi Shekhar said. It must be driven by the community. And these are uh, methodologies of how the community can take it forward. And it's uh, the groundwater governance standard is shortly going to be um, uh, published. You know, it is in the final stages of its designing. And so, uh, dear friends, I would like to, while I thank you all for coming to it, this is before I hand it over, I would like to say we would like to engage with you in, a, in these sort of intensive discussions, you know, in these three lines of thoughts as we go forward to work towards the sustainability of our ground, of our precious resource of water in our country and with our rural communities, and where we as citizens will also be equally responsible wherever we live. So uh, on my side, thank you. I will now invite uh, Ankita to say the final vote of thanks. Okay, thank you, Dr. Marcela. Uh, our most valued invited guests, keynote speakers, participants, and ladies and gentlemen, it is my privilege to have been asked to propose a vote of thanks today for the workshop on farm ponds for securing agriculture in rent-fed regions, a call for sustainable approach. I am Ankita Yadav on behalf of my team, uh, WCRES and Water, and on, on my own behalf, extend a very hearty uh, vote of thanks to all speakers for gracing your time, uh, time to listen and understand important work, findings, uh, and opinions of all the presenters today. A big thank you to Dr. Dipankar Saha, for setting the context of the meeting at the very beginning and who has been with us uh, and urged us to host the uh, workshop since he has visited the field as well as for his constant guidance for preparing the presentation. I would also like to mention our deep sense of appreciation for Mr. Uh, Shashi Shekhar, former secretary, and for Mr. Iknat Dawre, principal secretary for their keynote at this. We are grateful to Mr. Sunil Kumar, chairman, uh, for his presentation. We thank to Mr. CSR Murthy Nabar for sharing his views and Dr. Sanjay Srivastava, Vice Chancellor, for expressing his uh, reflections with us. Uh, furthermore, we would like to thank uh, Mrs. Nanda Kale uh, and Bhagwat Gagre from Maharashtra, uh, uh, Sri Pandit Madhunure, Telangana, and Sri Joshi, GSDA Government of Maharashtra. I would like to also express my gratitude to uh, Mr. KJ Joy for a facilitation of the workshop very nicely today. Uh, I would like to express a sincere thanks to Dr. Venkateshwarlu, former Vice Chancellor, for his inputs and key reflections on the webinar that we have received today. Uh, I express my gratitude to Dr. Marcela D'Souza for her overall guidance and inspiration that has driven us uh, to make this event success. I'm also grateful to the organizing and supporter uh, institutions, which include uh, Mano Rachna International University, National Rainfall uh, Area Authority, the Collaborative Ecobari Water and WGRES, also Nabad and Honeywell for their endorsement and support of this uh, webinar. Uh, lastly, I would uh, like to acknowledge our gratitude to the presenters, Dr. Pooja Prasad, uh, my colleagues, Dr. Taufik Vasi, Mr. Vijay Solanki, and Ms. Sarita Chandrakar, for, uh, for exposing us to their key findings and research. I thank IT and communications team, without whose efforts this workshop would not have been possible. Last but not the least, we would like to thank the participants who stayed with us throughout the workshop with patience and gave us the support. Thank you all for uh, participating in the workshop. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Thank you all. Yeah. Thank Bye. you.
Bye. Thank bye, you. bye. Bye. Great. Yeah. Thanks.